Yes, okay, so perhaps like I've got all my friends there and we can start. I, I... Um, perhaps we can start. Welcome everyone to the mm -hmm. third Team 5 uh, political economy conference within the Stack uh, Research Network. Um, as probably most of you know, I'm Monica Martinez Bravo, I'm Associate Professor at CENFI. Uh, in Spain, and I am co-leading this uh, Theme 5 initiative uh, with uh, Leonard Wanchekon. Uh, and to start, for those of you that might be new to this STEC conferences, let me give you a brief overview of what we're doing. Uh, STEC is a very large research initiative on structural transformation and economic growth, which uh, has the leadership of uh, Doug Colling and Joe Koroski. And within this initiative, we have five teams uh, that cover pretty much uh, measurement. Um, by the way, let me uh, pause here and ask all of you to mute your mics uh, if you haven't, because uh, otherwise we hear your background noise. But as I was saying, STEG is this uh, big research initiative, which has uh, five different um, five different uh, themes on data measurement, uh, firms, labor, productivity, trade, and spatial frictions. And theme five is political economy, which is, uh, as I said, led with Leonard Wansikon, which uh, who is also with, with us today. And both of us are going to um, lead then, or chair the, 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 um, the conference. STEC um, has a number of initiatives, some of the ones that are more popular among uh, many researchers is our fund calls for funding. Um, we are currently, we have currently opened the third uh, large research call for grants. So if you're interested in, in funding, check out the website. Uh, the deadline is October 3rd. And soon we will open the uh, six, if I remember correctly, small research grant call. So, uh, stay tuned for those and distribute widely among other researchers, including PhD students. We have also PhD students grants, so I know that it's typically sometimes hard to find these windows for funding for researchers that want to get their, their first step on the, on the research production. So uh, theme five uh, covers political economy friction, so we want to understand more broadly um, how political factors, both emerging from government action, but also from firms and um, special interest, trying to uh, set frictions or barriers to the process of economic growth, as well as to understanding in which cases they could be a triggering factor for virtuous process of uh, economic development. So if you have uh, research ongoing on this broad area, uh, please feel free to um, submit your research grants or your uh, submissions of papers for these conferences. And um, that's uh, pretty much what I uh, had to say in terms of the logistics for the conference. Um, each presentation should take about 30 minutes and we're going to reserve 10 minutes at the end for uh, questions and answers uh, in which we will encourage uh, all of you to raise your hand using the Zoom uh, button. And then we could uh, just, uh, you can just uh, unmute yourself and ask directly to the researcher. Uh, during the presentation, we prefer not to do those types of questions. So let's restrict to clarifying questions and you could type those through the chat and then we could either uh, respond or the co-authors could respond or, uh, you know, in certain cases we could, uh, Leonardo or I might uh, interrupt the speaker and raise uh, the question ourselves, right? But if you have deeper questions or comments, please use the last 10 minutes for every uh, talk. So um, let me see if uh, Leonard or Joe uh, want to say something else. Uh, if no. not, no. yeah, go ahead, Leonard. No, no, nothing. Yeah, thank uh, you. Okay, <laughs> great. So if not, let's move to the first speaker who is uh, Gianmarco Leon. Uh, pleasure to have you with us. So please share your screen and uh, the floor is yours. Of course, of course, I wasn't muted. 
Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for, for the opportunity to, to be part of this fantastic program and uh, Monica and, and Leonard for, for organizing. Um, and the work I'm, uh, so by the way, my, my co-authors are both traveling right now. So, so if you have uh, any, any questions, uh, clarifying questions, just pose them in the chat and, and uh, Monica, maybe you can pass them to me if relevant or otherwise we can discuss later. Uh, so this is a uh, joint work with, with Erika de Serrano, who's at Northwestern and, and Philip Castral, who's uh, at, at ID Insights. Uh, he was a former PhD student of mine. Uh, here uh, at UPF. And what we're going to, to be investigating in, in this project is the role of, of meritocracy uh, in the productivity of, of public sector uh, workers. Okay, and, and, and the, the motivation for, for this project is the observation that many organizations rely on promotion incentives to motivate the, the, their employees, right? And this has been widely documented both uh, empirically and, um, and theoretically. And this is especially the case in organizations that, that face different types of constraints to both to either dismiss workers or to offer them performance pay, as it is often the case uh, in, the, in the public sector where you observe uh, high rates of unionization, for example, uh, permanent contracts, uh, and, and the inability of the state to, to, to um, introduce high powered uh, incentives in the form of pay for work. Okay, so, and the, the success, just to start fixing ideas a little bit more, the success of promotion incentives are going to depend on two different, but at the same time interrelated concepts. On the one hand, you have uh, that the, the, the effect of promotion incentives is going to depend on how much the promotion rule is going to be meritocratic. And, here, and I'm going to, to define this a little bit better uh, in the next couple of slides. On the, uh, on the other hand, uh, the effectiveness of these types of incentives is going, also going to depend on pay progression. What is pay progression? Basically, is the size of the uh, of the price that you get once you get uh, promoted, right? And despite the wide attention that promotion incentives has have had uh, in the theoretical literature, right? And, and you can go back to the classic work by by Ed Lasher and, and Howard Ross in, in the eighties. Uh, the causal causal empirical evidence on the effectiveness of these types of incentives. Have been have been really elusive because basically it is very very hard to find uh, exogenous variation to to identify that that, that provides uh, gives you enough uh, enough variation in the extent to which promotions are made of right? Okay, so so in this paper what we're going to do is study uh, how worker productivity responds to a change in the promotion criteria whether you, you have it be more or less meritocratic and the size of the price associated with this promotion. And we're going to do this uh, using an experiment that, that, we, uh, that we did in collaboration with a large public sector organization in CRD. Okay, so in the paper, we have a model just, I, I will present just this slide on, on, on theory to, to fix ideas and, and, to, um, and to, um, to know what we're uh, trying to investigate here. Okay, so, so Imagine that you have two workers who are competing for a promotion, right? This is a, a very standard uh, tournament model where, where the, the utility of one worker is going to be a function of the effort uh, that she exerts as well as the effort that the other worker exerts. That, that, that this utility is going to be a function of uh, the wage that this person receives in her current position, plus the, pro, the, the, the wage bump that she would get if she if she is promoted, right? This is a difference between uh, W over bar and W under bar, times the probability that this promotion happens, okay? Minus a standard uh, con convex effort cost, okay? The promotion incentives are going to be a function of the price of the pay progression, right? The, the, the blue term over here, and the extent to which the promotion rule is performance-based. We're going to call a promotion rule to be meritocratic if it is entirely based on performance. Now, what can what, what 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 types of deviations can we have from meritocracy? Well, I can be uh, my boss's cousin, the, the the boss really likes me, and therefore um, there is going to be a bias in the in the in the in the decision. Okay, so. Uh, a promotion rule is going to deviate from meritocracy as the bias increases, all right? If, if, the, if the promotion rule is entirely meritocratic, we're going to have 
that, that the probability of promotion is going to be entirely determined by the difference between the efforts of the two players. Whereas if the promotion rule is very, very biased, then, then the probability of promotion is going to be completely uncorrelated uh, to, the, um, um, to, to, the, to the relative performance of, of the workers. Okay, so in, in this paper, we're going to, to vary both of, of, of these uh, key terms in, the, in this utility function. The pay progression, and the extent to which promotions are meritocratic. And we're going to, in, uh, to estimate the direct and interrelated effects of, of, of these uh, two issues. So let, let me just pause here uh, to see if there's a clarifying question in the chat. No? Okay, cool. Uh, okay, so let me give you a, a very brief overlook of, of the type of workers that we're going to be dealing with and the organization uh, with, with, with whom we collaborated. We're going to collaborate with the community health worker program in Sierra Leone, right? And, and, and the idea of this program is to uh, allow people to be kind of closer to the health services in a context where, where you have a very, very large travel costs and so on. And, and these community health workers have gained uh, quite a bit of importance in, in Sierra Leone, especially after the Ebola outbreak of, of 2015. The way the, the program is organized is around you can think about it uh, as, as clinics, where you have one clinic with a catchment area of several villages, and you have one health worker posted in each of these villages. They all have a supervisor who is based uh, at the clinic and who is in charge of supervising all the, all the workers. Community health workers are, so the, the community health workers are going to be named as CHWs and the, and the supervisors are the peer supervisors, the PSs, okay? CSWs are hired locally, right? So th these are people who live in the community. They do not have uh, a professional uh, training, but rather they're trained for about 14 days on basic tasks related to preventive healthcare. Um, and and, and their, their role is to provide basic, basic health services to, to the community. For example, identify pregnant women, uh, conduct pre and postnatal checks, they treat not severe cases of, for example, malaria, diarrhea, uh, basically simple stuff, right? And, and when you come up uh, uh, with, with something that is more complicated, you just refer them to the to the PhD. Okay. The way we're going to be thinking about about the, these PhDs uh, and the community health workers is as teams, right? So you have one supervisor and a bunch of of, of workers uh, around. The health worker is the only one who provides health services and the supervisor uh, monitors and advises his workers, right? All these guys are part-time workers who receive a fixed wage, All right? So, so what's the status quo in terms of the, uh, of the two uh, main, um, main, main issues we're going to be studying here? In terms of pay progression, the CHWs and, and PSs uh, earn a fixed wage. The PS makes uh, 250,000 uh, Sierra Leone Leones, uh, that's about $29, whereas uh, workers earn uh, $17 per month, right? So there, there's, there's a pay gap. Uh, importantly, there's lack of transparency uh, on how much the boss makes, right? Which is very common. So I have no idea how much uh, the head of my department uh, makes. So, so I, I don't think this is, this is something that is very particular uh, to this setting. In fact, in our baseline survey, it was clear that only a third of the CHWs could uh, properly estimate how much their bosses make, right? And this is going to be key in, in our experimentalism. In terms of promotion, the status quo is that um, there is a PHU in charge. So this is a, a doctor that is, that is in charge of managing the, the clinic and, and all the catchment area, uh, who, who is the, the main decision maker. Right? This PNG in charge, though, does not have good information about uh, CHW performance. Right? They, they barely know the CHWs. Their information system is, is, is very, very bad. So, so they don't have, even if they wanted to make meritocratic promotions, they wouldn't have the data to use. Right? And actually, so, so, so what, what this leads is that uh, the status quo is that promotions are largely um, defined by by, by preferences, right? Uh, very idiosyncratic preferences of the PHU uh, in charge. We asked, uh, we asked about their, their connections and, and what we saw is that people who are currently PSs, 70% uh, of them are more connected than, C, than, than those uh, who applied for, who were eligible for the position uh, at, the, at the same time, right? 
Uh, and, and when we ask CHWs about, about the, the performance of the PS, most of CHWs thought that the guy who ended up being promoted was not the best, right? So, so these are all indications that the, 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 in the status quo, the promotion rule is vastly non-meritocratic. Right, I'll, I'm going to give you way much more data about this, but just want to give you a flavor of, of, of the of the set. All right. So what are we going to do here? We are going to implement a randomized control trial in which we assign each PA. The, the treatment unit is going to be the team, the clinic, right? And we assign the 372 PhDs where we work uh, to to two treatments: the meritocratic promotion treatment, in which we change the way the promotions and these are decided. We move from the status quo uh, to, a, to a system in which uh, we tell CHWs, hey, next time there is an opening for a PS. Ah, and importantly, the promotions are always within team. OK? So we, we tell CHWs, next time there is an opening for a promotion, the decision is going to be entirely made based on data on performance that we had been collecting uh, through different household surveys uh, and, 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 and different monitoring mechanisms. Okay, and, 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 and to do this, we got the government to, to agree, obviously, to, um, to commit uh, to, the, to the fact that next time there was an opening, we will provide data and they, will, they commit to make the promotion ba based on, on, on our data, right? The second treatment is going to be the pay progression treatment. Right, and this is going to be cross-randomized. So we have four cells uh, here. In this treatment, we tell CHWs about how much the boss makes. Okay, so so in, in yeah. uh, th those assigned to T pay one are going to be informed about the the PS pay and reminded about about their own pay. In in T pay zero, they are only reminded about the, the, the their own pay. Right, this this is relevant information because they all know how much they make. Okay, so uh, Gianmarco, can I interrupt? Yep. There is a clarifying question from Matteo Montanero who is asking yep. if they have, uh, if, since they are working part time, do they have side jobs? Uh, could this be a problem if they change their effort to search for these jobs? Yep, so, so, so basically these guys are farmers, farmers and petty traders, right? And, and, and we're going to, uh, our main outcome measure are going to, are, is going to be the number of visits that these guys uh, pr provide. Right, and, and we have self-reported data on hours work that is not super reliable, but we have some, some results on that in the, in the paper as well. Um, I hope that, that answers your question, otherwise we can keep discussing later. Okay, so th there are two key features of the research design that I would like to, hi uh, to highlight. First, notice that the, the TPA is going to be an information feed. So we will not, assess the effect of actual changes in pay progression on the effect on, on workers' productivity, because if the, if the boss gets paid, more, gets paid more in a context where there are complementarities, you can, uh, you can observe increases in worker productivity that are only linked to the, to the pay of the PS and, and are unrelated to the promotion incentives. Second, notice that T merit is going to be to change the perception of meritocracy in anticipation of any future promotion, right? So we don't need a promotion to happen in, in order to see uh, effects. And this is important, again, to, to, to clearly identify uh, the, the effects. All right, so our empirical analysis, so here we have a, a two by two uh, design, but notice here that we cannot run a standard uh, regression where we have on the right-hand side, the pay, uh, T merit and the interaction because the, the response of the worker to the uh, to T pay is going to really depend on my priors, right? So if I think that the that the boss makes more than it that he, she actually makes, my update is going to go downwards. Whereas if I think that the boss makes less money uh, than than what I thought, the 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 update is going to be upwards, right? So so what this implies is that our our regression model is going to be this very ugly uh, expression that is basically a two by two regression interacted with dummies that tell you whether my prior was below, above, or at the truth, okay? We are going to make, all the time, we're going to make comparison that we claim are causal within worker type, 
meaning within workers that have a prior below the truth, within workers that have a prior above the truth, because that the, the experimental design allows us to make causal uh, comparisons, whereas uh, between types of workers that could be uh, that could be contaminated by, by other observable or unobservable determinants uh, of, of their priors. All right, so first I'm going to show you the effects of, of, of meritocracy alone, and then the effects of paper pressure. So how do we measure so meritocracy? Marco, you... um, yeah. sorry, one clarifying question from me. So then is it just if you have eight cells or like the merit, have... non merit, and for the pay is like you interact with above and below or? Yes, exactly. Uh, above, below, or at the truth. At the truth is going to be kind of our placebo, no? Because we, we don't have our information treatment does not change anything. Okay. No, so we have okay. 12. Okay, thank you. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. uh, okay, so we've been talking uh, quite a bit about meritocracy, but, but this is, a, a, I mean, Erika, Philip, and I spend a lot of time trying to figure out how do we measure your perception about meritocracy, right? And, and this is the best we, call, we could come up with. We asked each CHW the following question. We told them, okay, imagine a, a PSU needs a new PS. Whom of the following two CHWs is going to be most likely promoted to, 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 the, to the position of supervisor? A non-connected CHW who is the best performer, right? Who is ranked one out of 10 or a connected, and here connected means that, that is friends with a, with a PSU in charge, who is ranked X. And X can be, Two, five, or ten. All right. So, so if if the worker tells us that the connected uh, CHW who is ranked tenth is is going to be is more likely to be promoted, then we're going to say this is a, a very non meritocratic organization. All right. So we code this in a scale of minus minus one, zero, uh, or one, but the, the 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 coding is is irrelevant. You see the same patterns uh, throughout. Okay. So on the, here, I'm showing you. Uh, workers' priors and posteriors. The priors are balanced first uh, between team merit one and team merit zero. Uh, you have about 45 uh, to 50% of people who say that the half of the people say that these non that the promotions are non meritocratic. Workers who are in teams that we experimentally, uh, in, in which we experimentally change the promotion criteria to be meritocratic, massively shift their perceptions about how meritocratic promotions are going, okay? Whereas in the control group, uh, nothing changes. All right, so this is the, the variation that we're going to be using. Okay, so now effects. Uh, here, I'm going to show you a bunch of, of graphs because uh, clearly with 12 cells, uh, the, the tables are very ugly. Um, on average, being, ex uh, being in, a, in a team uh, with meritocratic promotions, so, so th these are, as I, as I mentioned before, our main outcome variables is going to be the number of visits workers make to households, right? Uh, and, and our outcome is going to be the average number of visits that a household received in the uh, year preceding our end line survey, okay? And everything is going to be uh, for, uh, information coming from, um, from households, right? The average household receives uh, 5.5 uh, visits, and this increases by 1.5 uh, for workers who are in a, in a meritocratic. Now, who who should respond much more? We in in, in the second panel we are, we are showing you the heterogeneity of the impact by workers' priors about the, the PSP, right? And we see that workers who think that the prior uh, is uh, think that the boss is making a lot of money are the ones driving these results, right? And th this is a, a heterogeneity analysis. Here I'm, I'm still not exploiting the experimental variation in paper pressure, okay? And this is consistent uh, with our model theory. The second, the, the second con heterogeneity that we run is by when you think the promotion is going to happen, right? If you're in a meritocratic treatment and you think that the promotion is going to be happening sooner, you have much more incentives to work harder and this is exactly what we see uh, here. Workers who, uh, who have uh, a PS that is close to the retirement age uh, work, uh, work hard, right? Finally, the, the, the third heterogeneity that we run is with respect to workers, uh, uh, what, what 
in, in our model is uh, worker ability. We measure it by the rank of the CHW within the team, right? And, and the basic idea here is that promotion incentives are going to be relevant only if you are a relatively high ability worker, right? If you are the dumb kid in the, in the team, regardless of whether uh, promotions are meritocratic or not, you're never going to be promoted, right? So for those, those for people at the bottom of the distribution, you're never going to see changes uh, in effort, whereas uh, for workers high rank, we see that these guys are driving all the results, right? Importantly, uh, uh, Gianmarco, may I yep. interrupt if you don't mind? Um, so Lakshmi has a question on how do you define connected? And I also had another question of uh, whether you measure the perceived how do you measure the perceived pay of the supervisor? I mean, wouldn't it be more relevant to think, to ask yeah. how much do you think you would make if you were promoted or something like that? So co connection is is connected to the to a PHU in charge, right? Uh, it, it is um, based on, on a question of um, how many years have you uh, met, uh, have you known this person, right? Uh, and uh, the prior of the PS pay is at baseline, we ask them, how much do you think your boss makes? And this is an incentivized question. And the posterior, in a sense? Or? In the, the, the posterior, we asked it right uh, two weeks after that treatment. I, I'm going to show you data on exactly oh, okay. that in two slides. Okay. So, uh, right. So, so all, all this is only exploiting the experimental variation in whether the promotions are meritocratic or, or not. I, I'm going to introduce uh, the, the, the PS, the variation in, in pay progression in, in the next few slides. All right, so here we can we can have a classic quantity quality trade off. We miss, we we measure quality by the length of the visit, right? These guys are not experts uh, in in healthcare, so they basically when they visit a household, they follow a checklist. A reduced time of visit is a good indication of a lower quality, visit, right? We, we don't see such reduction in 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 the in visit quality, and. The increase in the number of visits is partially explained by an increase in retention. So some workers drop out and they're more likely to, to drop out. Uh, the, the, the patterns of, of, of dropout follow exactly the same patterns as we see with the number of, of, of visits, but, but it is not, so most of the variation in the number of visits is, uh, is explained by effort and not by retention, right? And importantly, there's no effects on PSF. And, and this, is, this is because the, um, the fact that I work harder does not make more the PS more likely to be fired. Basically, they are, they're, in their, they're safely in their posts and there's only going to be a promotion when the PS decides. Uh, to. All right, so now, now, now to the, 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 that in terms of effects of, of meritocracy. Now, now let's move to pay progression. All right, so, so this, this is the, the question Monica was, was asking before. Uh, here again, on the left-hand side, we have uh, the prior of PSP for the treatment and the control group and the posteriors, right? In terms of, of the priors, we see that, uh, as I told you before, 30% of people know how much the PS makes, right? This is centered at zero. Whereas 30% think that the PS makes more than the truth and 30% think that the PS makes less than the truth, right? The dispersion is larger on the right-hand side uh, than, than here, because basically this is bounded by my own salary, right? So, so the, the, there's a very, very few people that think that the boss makes less than me. Um, uh, okay, what happens when we inform them about the PSP? Basically everyone converges, right? And this distribution does not change much, all right? So, so now uh, we are going to estimate the effect of T-Pay in a meritocratic regime and a non-meritocratic regime. And as I mentioned, I'm going to make comparisons within a worker type, within workers who update upwards and within workers who update downwards. Um, so so th th these are, these are the, the, main, the main findings uh, of this section of the paper. If you are in, in a high meritocracy uh, team and you update upwards, so, so do you think that the pay progression is very high? Your, your performance is going to increase by 1.8 bits, right? So, so this, is, this is very big. This is about a 26% uh, increase in, um, in, in performance. What happens now 
if you are in a low meritocracy regime and you learn that your boss makes a lot of money. Here we see an almost symmetric decrease in performance. All right. Uh, and now I'm going to go into the mechanisms in, 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 in a little bit, but basically uh, what, what our evidence shows is that this is going to be driven by a negative morale effect, right? I, I learned that the boss makes a lot of money, no matter how hard I work, I'm never going to, 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 to get access to, to that uh, golden price. Alternatively, it could be also that, that uh, it really pisses me off that this person at the top has not the, he is not qualified enough uh, to, 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 be, to be the boss, right? Uh, when we look at, at um, high meritocracy and low pay progression, as you expect that the effect is, is negative, right? And same, and, and same, but with less precision for low meritocracy and low pay progression. All right, so steeper pay progression reduces worker productivity in a non-meritocratic regime, right? So what could be the mechanisms? What could be the, the, the morale concerns story that, that I just told you? But, but an alternative model that would be consistent with this finding could be something related to multitasking, right? We have productive and unproductive tasks. Productive tasks is providing health services. Unproductive tasks is going to have a beer uh, with the boss. Right, a, a lobbying story, uh, basically. Right, the evidence is consistent with moral concerns. Right, we do not see effects on the number of times the CHW reports having spoken with a PSU in charge in the in the past uh, past couple of months, or the time devoted to non-patient direct uh, related activities. Right, whereas the effect on productivity uh, we see is much more concentrated in workers whom we expect to perceive the, the system as more unfair, right? B workers who are highly ranked uh, are those who are unsatisfied with the PS. All right, so, so ju just, just to conclude, let, let, let me go, um, I think I'm good in time. Okay, so why do we think the, these results are, are, are important? One, one observation that, that, that we've had is that Manager worker pay ratios has grown exponentially around the world in the in the past few decades, right? So if you looked at, at the at the private sector in the U.S., for example, it has increased tenfold in the past uh, 50 years. Likewise, if you look at the public sector, you see that the worker the the manager worker uh, pay ratio has increased fivefold over the, the past 10 years, and this is very much related uh, to a push from international organizations to say, look. If, if, if your government wants to have competent professional managers, you have to increase their pay. Otherwise, they will go to the, pri to, to the, to the, uh, to the private sector, right? So which, which makes, makes total sense, all right? But what, what, um, let, let's put these stylized facts along with, with, with our finding. And, and, and what we find, remember, is that steeper pay progression can boost performance of lower tier workers only if they are combined with a meritocratic system, right? In a sense, meritocracy and pay progression complement each other, right? And, and actually, in the paper, we have a couple of, of, of cool graphs where we show um, the, the cross-country uh, distribution of both pay progression and meritocracy. And what you see is that the in richer, richer countries has, have much more meritocracy and richer countries also have the least pay progression, right? So, so, so it seems like, like uh, sorry, the, the other way around. In poorer countries, you have way much more pay progression, right? So poorer countries have exactly the bad combination. High pay progression, low meritocracy, all right? But so steeper pay progression may have ambiguous effects in non-meritocratic systems in a sense, right? We, we have measured the effects of, of pay progression and meritocracy uh, in, in the productivity of lower tier workers, we found that, that high pay progression, low meritocracy decreases low, uh, lower tier workers' performance, but high, obviously higher pay for the managers can lead to higher productivity of, of, of the, right? So, so, so th this is uh, kind of uh, the, the, the core trade-off that, that we want to point out, uh, right? So, so in, in a sense, our results suggest that non-meritocratic organizations should combine increases in pay progression with more meritocratic promotions. But this is, this is conditional on the ability of organizations, of public sector organizations, 
uh, to obtain reliable performance uh, data, which remains be, being a challenge, but much, much less now that we have access to uh, different types of, of technologies, right? And, and here I just leave the seat for a new project that we are planning with uh, with Erika and, uh, and the Sierra Leone and Ministry of Health. All right, I'll, I'll leave it here. Thank you, Jean Marco, right on time. Um, there are uh, more questions on the chat, but given that we reach uh, this point, please feel free to raise your hand and, and ask directly. Um, Lakshmi, do you want to start with your question? Yeah, um, I had a small question, which is, are these community health workers all female? And if not, are there differential effects of these treatments by gender? I'm mm -hmm. saying because there are other papers which say that uh, women often get more discouraged uh, or, or discouraged mm -hmm. early from setbacks and so on. So surprisingly, 70% um, of these uh, workers are male. Um, and we do not have heterogeneous effect by, 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 by gender. Thank you. Uh, so I have a, a question. Um, so I, I guess that my question is whether you, you measured attitudes or beliefs about whether the system is fair or, you know, are wages fair and so on. Because I, I mean, I was wondering um, the way you measure the strength of pay progression is by asking them how, you know, by, by using this fact that the supervisor is, is being paid more or less than what you expected. Mm -hmm. But it's not clear, I mean, it's probably correlated, but it's not exactly clear whether how that, whether that perfectly correlates with, you know, how much do you think you would make if, if you were to, to be promoted? Um, so, ah, okay, so, yeah. so, so, so the, 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 this is a very interesting question because um, so, so if, if they, if the, the, there is clearly a, a compensating differential when, when you change jobs, right? So, so if, if you give me, uh, if you promote me and you promote me to, to a job I really dislike, right? I would, um, I would request way much more money, right? Mm -hmm. So. We didn't ask for fairness, but rather uh, for for perceptions about what's the was a job of the of the of the supervisor, right? And we don't see that that uh, the treatments affected neither the number of hours that workers think that the boss is going to invest, nor the number the, the amount of money that, that they should spend in in monitoring or, or transporting the, the, themselves, right? Uh, um, yeah, but we, 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 I mean, in, in summary, we do not have data on, on how much you think the fair wage is, but we, we know very clearly what people think the role of the supervisor is, and that is, and that is not affected by the, by the treatments. I see. Thank you. Uh, Luis, go ask your question. I believe Clement was was first, but since you gave ah, me the floor, okay. I'll, I'll do you yeah, want to go I'm first, Clement? Okay, so I'll I'll be quick. Uh, Gianmarco, I was wondering the the measure of productivity that you have seems to correspond to like a very simple task, like go visit an extra house, mm -hmm. and arguably that kind of magnifies their response because you're giving an incentive and it's very straightforward to know what do I have to do to, to reap the reward. So, you know, mm -hmm. I have two questions. On the one hand, do you have a sense of the impact that this has on downstream outcomes, which is what we ultimately care about? And mm -hmm. also I, I see your experiment almost like as a proof of concept in this very stylized oh. setting, but I'm wondering what do we learn regarding more complicated bureaucratic environments, you know, where, where like mm. the objective function is, is not as simple and like, okay, I tell you, if you do better, I'll reward you. But understanding what it means to do better is not as, as straightforward as here. Right, so, so very interesting question as, as, as usual, Luis. Um, so, so here, yeah, the, 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 the task is, um, is relatively simple, is, um, it's easy to measure, and then that's why I work with community health workers and teachers and, and, and so on, uh, because we can measure uh, productivity relatively um, easily. Um, 
in terms of of, um, of what do we learn for for more more, more complex organizations? I, I I agree with you that I mean we can we can always build much more complications into uh, in, in, into the setting and, and and to some extent this is. Um, uh, this is a proof of concept, but but some of the stylized uh, features of, of, of these teams, I think, are very very common uh, to to frontline service provision, right? So so for teachers, you have you have a task force, right? For for agricultural extension workers, you have um you 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 have like the number of plots that they they visited and, and done uh, a, a training. Um, now it, it can start getting complicated. For example, if, if you think of a setting where, um, so here one key thing in, we, in which we rely to to generate external validity is the fact that being a good health worker is a very good predictor of who is going to be a good uh, a good supervisor, right? And, and and in that way, by saying that increases in productivity. Um, uh, are unambiguously good for, for the organization uh, is, is, is kind of a, a global statement. Now, now we, you can run into a more complex organization, for example, a university, right? If you promote me to be the chair of the department, the fact that I'm a, a, a decent researcher is absolutely unpredictable of, of how I do as chair. I'll probably be a very, very bad chair, right? And that, that, that's kind of the Peter principle that, that, that you, uh, that you rise in the organization up up until your point of of, of uh, failure, um, and 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 that that is that could be very very organization uh, specific or bureaucratic specific. And finally, on your point on on the health outcomes, in another paper with with, with Eric and Philip, we look uh, so there's an extensive literature on the effects of health, health workers uh, on health outcomes. So we don't focus much on 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 that on this paper. On this other paper, uh, we we clearly see that the increases in number of visits. Are, are very much related to, to relevant health outcomes. Okay, thank you. So next is Clement. We're running out of time, so please uh, please keep the question and answers short. Sure. Yeah, sorry, uh, whatever. <laughs> great paper. Uh, one question I had is, one thing that's quite specific about your paper is that the measure that you can use to promote them in the meritocratic treatment um, is sort of given by the the, the population that they interact with rather than their manager. But in a lot of other situations, it's the manager that would make some assessment that determines whether you get promoted or not. And in these cases, you have more chances of you know, collusion or what, what in your setting was the less meritocratic treatment. So do you have a sense of how your results could apply in these cases where the manager is the one in charge of promoting or, or of judging whether you, you should be promoted or not? I mean, the, 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 the nice thing about our setting is we, that we have a disconnect between the supervisor, the position to which you would rise, and the decision maker, who is the PhD in charge, right? What you're saying is that in many cases, if, if these two uh, are, are together, and, and that that's, we kind of shy a little bit away of, of, of those kind of uh, Tirol models of, of, of collusion between the supervisor, because in, in this setting, uh, there's not much role or much monitoring role of the of the supervisor. Actually, in the other paper, we, we highlight the productive role of, 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 of these guys. And and one of the points in the conclusions uh, that, that I mentioned speaks directly to, to your point, right? So to to make these meritocratic systems work, you really need an objective measure of, of performance, right? And, and that's that's one thing that is really preventing us uh, from doing this in a large ministry, for example, right? Where, where, where the productivity measure is imposed, an objective productivity measure is impossible uh, to get. But for, for a bunch of, of roles, we can get a, a good productivity measure, especially with, with new technologies. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, last question from Aime. Yeah, thank you very much for, <clears throat> um, I'm following uh, this workshop from DRC, from Congo. I am MA, as you can see. I've got two questions. The first is uh, in the chat, where I would like to understand more how to pay meritocracy while resources are low, although the country or the boss uh, recognizes 
uh, the productivity of the employee? That is the first question. The second is um, then about uh, uh, someone uh, uh, tried to talk about gender, it means uh, female. But uh, my question is, um, anyway, in that sense, but um, perhaps in another way, how to pay meritocracy of women staying at home? I'm taking the context of my country, DRC in Africa, where the woman has good tasks, but uh, uh, these tasks are not more recognized or paid. Uh, the task of uh, mm -hmm. this woman is not uh, paid. Is there any demonstration that uh, can uh, illustrate the way this meritocracy uh, um, from the household uh, can be paid? Uh, mm -hmm. As we are also talking about uh, meritocracy. Thank you. Yeah, very, very good points. Thank you for, for the question. So, so on, on your first question, uh, how can we enforce this in, in, a, in, a, in a setting where resources are low? Uh, we are very much aware of, of this fact. And actually, like a, a core thing in, in part of our projects is how do you change the organizational uh, structure in order to increase productivity while keeping the, the budget fixed, right? So, so notice that, that here we are, we are changing the way promotions are made, right? And, and, and in a sense, this is costless, right? Because you wait for someone to retire, then you decide how the next person who replaces uh, the retiree uh, is, is chosen, right? So, so it's, a, it's a budget, it's an organizational decision that in a sense is budget neutral. Um, your question on, on, on gender, I'm afraid, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating uh, and hyper important issue, but I'm afraid that, it, that, that is a little bit outside the, the scope of, of, of this paper. So as much as I would like to have something to say about it, uh, the results don't, don't allow me to go there. Great, thank you very much, Jan Marco, and thanks everyone for the questions. So let's uh, move to the next speaker, it's Lakshmi here. Uh, so please share your slides and the floor is yours. Uh, you're muted, Lakshmi. Sorry. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present my work. This is joint work with Latika Chaudhary, who's at the Naval Postgraduate School, which is in California. So it's very early for her and she's not able to join, unfortunately. So I will apologize in advance. I cannot monitor the chat while speaking. So Monica, if you can just highlight important questions there, that would be uh, super helpful. So um, what do we do in this uh, paper? We are looking at the human development consequences of administrative decentralization. What do I mean by this term? This is the transfer of responsibility for providing public services from the central government and its agencies to subnational or subordinate levels of government. Uh, and this is distinct from fiscal decentralization, which involves the transfer of taxing and spending powers to lower levels of government. And it's also different from political decentralization, which refers to the extent to which the local governments are directly elected by citizens. Now, this is uh, our work is in the context of India, but this is by no means an India specific reform initiative. Uh, by one count, 123 countries have implemented some form of administrative decentralization. Uh, over the last few decades. So this is a very, um, very widely implemented reform uh, all across the world. The unfortunate thing is that the development consequences of decentralization are both theoretically ambiguous, and I'll outline some, some arguments for why it's theoretically uh, ambiguous, and many previous empirical studies have found conflicting results. So the overall literature is somewhat inconclusive. We suggest some reasons why that might be the case. So what do we do? Uh, we are looking, as I said, in the Indian context uh, and uh, where the decentralization was implemented via uh, a couple of constitutional amendments in 1993. So unlike many other places which decentralized from central government to say subnational, provincial or state, in India, the decentralization was from state governments to more local governments. But given that Indian states are often the size of uh, many countries or even bigger, 
this is sort of comparable to other types of decentralization. So what did this reform do? This reform set up a three-tier system of local government. So it's not just one level of local government, but three separate tiers. Uh, and it had provisions for all types of decentralization, administrative, fiscal, political. And I'm going to give you some details, obviously, in a couple of slides. For, luckily for us, in an empirical setting, the dates of actual implementation of the administrative decentralization varied considerably across different states. And so we are able to use a difference in difference identification strategy to look at the effect uh, of this reform. The other nice thing about the Indian setting is also we're able to uh, distinguish the specific components of administrative decentralization, which we don't find in other previous studies. And again, our details I will give you in just a couple of slides. The main result in case somebody has to leave to go somewhere uh, is that if you devolve the responsibility for providing health and education, those are the two main outcomes we're looking at, to local governments, but you don't give them the authority over the personnel who are supposed to deliver the services, or if you don't give them any fiscal powers, then you actually find detrimental outcomes. You find increases in child mortality and reductions in primary schooling. So it's not just neutral, it's actually bad. So we have to be, uh, it, it's, uh, I like, it, it's a nice thing to be in the session with Gianmarco because we are also seeing similar types of, you know, you need two things together to make a difference. Hmm. So I mentioned before that theoretically the effects of administrative decentralization are ambiguous. And this is, uh, people have said this is a good thing to, to devolve to local governments because they have better information on the local resources. They know what the citizens like, they know what the citizens need, uh, and they may have a better ability to actually monitor the bureaucrats or the health workers or whoever is delivering the services. And so for all these reasons, it is better for local governments to be in charge of things. But on the other hand, if there are economies of scale in some kinds of service provision, if actually state capacity is weaker at the local level, or if local governments are more easily captured or there's greater corruption at the local level, then it may not be good to decentralize to the local level. And what we are highlighting here, uh, most of these theory models are comparing um, centralized control over a particular function to decentralized control. And what we're saying is actually it depends on the monitoring structure because we are finding the worst effects when it, there's a partial sharing of responsibility, when the local governments are in charge of the delivery of the functions, but they don't have control over the workers who are delivering the function. So in some sense, we think of this as a multiple principle setting, uh, and we find that this actually has a, a very detrimental effect. And there are some models about such multiple principle setting where it can exacerbate moral hazard or adverse selection problems. And sometimes it could be because of free riding among the principles. So nobody monitoring is a costly task and nobody wants to take it on. And so uh, as a result, maybe nobody wants, the monitoring is less than optimal. And so workers do not put in the right effort. Mm. So just a few couple of thoughts on the contributions we make. There is a very large literature on decentralization uh, but I think we are providing first a well-identified study. Many prior studies are, have relatively weak identification. Uh, and second, we are uh, able to study the effects of administrative decentralization alone. So um, a lot of countries implemented a whole bundle of packages at the same time. So it's hard to separate out which part of decentralization matters or does not matter. Uh, and I think this is something which explains uh, why even well-identified studies, many uh, recent uh, studies based on difference and differences, uh, which is pretty well uh, done studies, also find very different results. They have positive results in, you know, in, in a paper in Brazil and Switzerland and, uh, and Colombia, but if you look at Vietnam and Indonesia, you find negative results. So the, the results are still all over the place. Uh, as I said, we are able to distinguish administrative decentralization from other dimensions, but we're also go able to sort of see whether the fiscal dimension matters or not. So we can run a kind of interactive specification. And I think the other main contribution is even within administrative decentralization, we are able to have a nuanced approach where we can contrast what I mean, partial decentralization versus full. And we find that partial is the one which really uh, worsens outcomes, while the full doesn't really improve them, but at least it does not worsen them. Mm. So let me quickly go through the Indian context. Um, India is a particularly, uh, India ranks very low in the UN, UN's Human Development Index. Uh, and, and a lot of this has been attributed 
to a very poor quality of public service provision. So a lot of health and education facilities are now available in many places because the Indian government throughout for many decades in the 60s and the 70s had a policy of providing these um, services. So they had rules like every village must have a primary school and every um, there must be a public health center within such and such a distance and so on. So there was a lot of equalization of access and yet the quality of provision is very poor. We have other studies which show things like widespread absenteeism. So this 2006 study found that 40% of health service providers and 26% of teachers are absent. So it's a question of the um, effort uh, from the uh, worker side, not just not, not the availability of workers uh, or the availability of a health center, but actually delivery of services. Uh, and similarly, this last et al study finds that a lot of people prefer to visit private doctors uh, even though these private doctors are much less qualified because the public sector doctors are not putting in an effort. At the same time, there have been many studies, which I cite here, which show that monitoring, better monitoring of public service providers, either through community, um, uh, community agreements or through installing cameras or things like that, actually improves service delivery. And so what we are asking is, well, decentralization also has this potential. Uh, does it work like that? This is the Indian decentralization reform. As I said, there were constitutional amendments in 1993 which set up this three-tier system of local governments with local bodies, which I will call panchayats, that's what they call in India, at three different local levels. So um, in terms of administrative decentralization, there were 29 different areas uh, which were supposed to be decentralized to these local bodies, including health and education. But as I said, the pace has been very slow and uneven across different states. Uh, the amendment also said you must have fiscal decentralization, there must be state finance commissions and revenue sharing with local governments, not much progress over there. So as late as 2015, the aggregate figure which you got from a government report is that the local bodies are only generating 8% of the revenues uh, from taxes, that means they are highly dependent on state and central government for their actual revenues. Uh, political decentralization, these local bodies were supposed to be democratically elected every five years, and one third of the seats were also to be filled by women. This is the part of the reform which has been actually implemented by all the states, uh, and a lot of work also has been done on the effect of these gender quotas uh, on various types of outcomes. Mm. But the other two aspects haven't been explored uh, at all. So this is the list of 29 functions which are supposed to be given to the local governments. I've highlighted the two we are most interested in. Uh, which is number 26, health and sanitation, including hospitals, primary health centers and dispensaries, education, including primary and secondary schools. So, uh, Lakshmi, so, can I ask a uh, clarifying yeah. question? Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so then the, the administrative decentralization was uh, from the district to the village level? Of what, what is no, the from state to district, intermediate and village. So okay, all so these functions the, were run the by the state and they were supposed to give it to the lo now more local. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the other question is, uh, was this like a budget neutral uh, reform? Like, it's just that they, it's different, the, the, the agency that has authority, but they yes. didn't increase or decrease the budget. No, they didn't. In fact, that we examined those very specifically, the, um, there's nothing in the, the budget doesn't change. So it okay. was one thing we were worried about uh, when we saw mm -hmm. initial results that the um, mortality outcomes are worsening. We said maybe it's because the state now says, oh, we have devolved this responsibility, so we start giving you any money. Um, and we control for the money part, and it doesn't make any difference. Hmm. So okay. interestingly, there was no, no budgetary change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so just to uh, demonstrate how the states did it, uh, so to be in compliance with the constitutional amendment, all states amended their existing laws uh, very quickly, but when we read all the laws of each of the states, there was huge variation. So some law, some states actually specified exactly what level of panchayats would do what. This is what we call activity mapping. And other states were super vague. And they just said, oh, the village panchayat may perform functions related to health. But which functions uh, and how and you know who's going to, be, which part will be to the village and which part will be the district, nothing specified. Uh, and so the Federal Planning Commission got disappointed and they asked states to do this, right? Please do this activity mapping, which is specify what each level of your local government is supposed to do. And then you need to pass an order saying, okay, from such and such a date is when the local governments are taking over. And you should also transfer the necessary functionaries, which is the officials in charge of, the, uh, of delivering these functions. And so there was some uptick after that, but not 
huge. I'll show you a little bit the data in a second. So this is the data we collected. We went and looked at all the states and we made an indicator which it was one in the year when state governments actually do this activity map. Some of them, as I said, did it in the original legislation, others did it a few years later. Uh, and then we also looked for the date of the executive order in which it actually comes into force. And so that's when we called, okay, now you have actually devolved. You have told the lower level governments who's supposed to do what and from which date. And we have many, many different official sources for this. We read lots and lots of government reports. We read the state legislations. We read, we looked at the state websites of, of the various ministries and so on. Um, we also made, along the way when we were reading all this, we found, uh, we also coded what we call functionaries devolution because we found that many states which actually devolved their functions didn't actually transfer the functionaries, didn't say, okay, from this day forth, now the public health workers are going to report to the local government. They never specify that. Uh, and so they only transferred functions without functionaries. Uh, and so we are able to code this to some extent less precisely because we don't have for every year, but we have we know whether they had done it by 2007, and we know whether they had done it by 2015. We can make an approximation of roughly when they did it. So this is our way of approximating it. It actually doesn't matter much. We change the coding by uh, two or three years. It doesn't make a difference. We just did it by a dummy for whether you devolve these functionaries at all, and our results are very similar. So the exact timing of this doesn't really matter. It matters whether you did it or not. So let me explain what this activity mapping means in practice. So this is the kind of things that they usually specify. So they say things like the district and the intermediate panchayats are going to assist in the national and state health programs. They're going to organize public health programs. They're going to oversee the construction of public health facilities. They are going to coordinate against epidemics and infectious diseases. They are going to do surveys. And the village panchayat, of, village panchayat obviously has lower level functions. They help to execute the public health program. So, you know, the district and intermediate panchayat will be in charge of delivering vaccines to the village and the village panchayat is the one who will actually um, put it into the arms of people. Uh, they don't oversee construction of the subcenter, but they will identify which land is suitable for it. They will do more uh, local things like um, sanitation uh, initiatives and so on. In terms of the functionaries, we found that there's no, not really full devolution. So for instance, doctors cannot be hired and fired uh, by local governments, even when they have devolved the functionaries. They are the upper end of the health uh, workers and they, they are still under the control of the state government rather than local. But um, if you have devolved the functionaries, it means that the local government can monitor these doctors. They can file complaints against them. They can uh, do lower level sanctions. Like if the doctor is really not doing the job, they can um, suspend them. And they have some power over lower level employees uh, to be to, to hire and fire. So some, um, some accountability to local government, not, not necessarily full. Uh, and then we collected the data on other dimensions. So the fiscal decentralization, we have only a dummy for whether the local governments at each level collect any taxes whatsoever. Uh, and only in five states do they even collect any taxes. And then for the political decentralization, we have the date of the first election with the one third gender quota, which was the new thing introduced by this uh, constitutional amendment. And so this is the graph we found. The blue graph, the blue line is telling you for each year, how many states actually devolved the health functions to the local level. We're tracking 25 states uh, all over India. And you can see that even in 2015, which is more than two decades after the constitutional amendment, um, seven states still had not done the actual devolution of telling the local governments, you can do these functions and what functions they can do. So it's, it's, there's, a huge vari and there's a huge variation over time as well. Uh, in contrast, if you see the orange line, the gender quota has been implemented by all the states now, with some variation in timing, which we used in a, in a previous paper, but it, it has been done much faster and every state did the political decentralization before uh, the administrative one. So for outcomes, we are going to look at child mortality outcomes uh, because they are widely used as indicators of health quality and they have the potential to be actually affected by public health measures. So the public health system is in charge of say, you know, delivering nutrition information to pregnant mothers, providing them things like iron supplements and tetanus shots and uh, referring them to uh, upper uh, other types of health facilities if they are having some pregnancy complications and so on. And they're also in charge of providing immunization uh, to the uh, children. 
So just like the community health workers in, in Sierra Leone, there's, there's a lot of things they do of basic health care. And so they can actually um, have the potential to shape infant mortality. We get this data from this DHS survey for India for the 2015 and 16 wave, which is very, very huge. We have more than 1 million live births. Uh, and so we can, we're able to track infant mortality for each year based on these retrospective birth histories. So we're tracking three things. One is neonatal mortality, which is uh, if the child dies within the first month of birth, infant mortality, if the child dies within the first year of birth, and under five mortality, if the child dies within the first five years of birth. So a little bit longer term, uh, which can be shaped obviously a lot by vaccinations and so on. We have other supplementary outcomes, which I'll get to uh, when we get there. We run a very simple difference in different specification. We have the outcome, which is the uh, infant mortality or child mortality as the case may be, for child I, status, birth year T, state fixed effects, time fixed effects, a dummy uh, for devolution. Uh, and we say you are exposed to devolution if the state devolved uh, at least one year before you were born. This is to take care of things like the antenatal care, which can shape uh, both outcomes. We control for all kinds of uh, family characteristics. Are you in a rural or an urban area? Your, your caste and your religion and uh, gender of the child and the um, sort of education of the mother and, and so on, okay? So these are our first set of results. So when we do this very simple difference in different specification, uh, we actually find that if a state has devolved health, so we're comparing each state to itself before and after, infant mortality rates actually go up. So the probability that a child will die within one year goes up uh, and within first five years also goes up. Okay, so this is, uh, so remember here the positive coefficients, the stars are significance levels, the standard errors are in parentheses and in brackets you have the uh, wild bootstrap uh, p-value. This is not a good thing, okay? Positive is not good here because it means mortality is going up. So this is on the face of it, not at all good news. The, what we found is what we wanted to go deeper into this and we look, wanted to look at how you devolve. Did you devolve just the functions or did you devolve the functions and the functionaries? Ex ante, it could go either way. So it could make, if you devolve the functionaries along with functions, it could make it more effective or it could make it worse because if you're able to collude uh, with the, your responsible only to the local authorities, now you're able to bribe the local officials to overlook your absenteeism, et cetera. So it could actually make things worse. So we run this interactive specification. We have the original devolution dummy, and then we have the interaction with the functions, functionaries devolution dummy. So beta one is the coefficient, is the impact of only devolving functions without the officials or the functionaries. Beta two is the additional effect of devolving both functions and functionaries. So for states which did both, the total effect is beta one plus beta two. So this is what we find. We find that the earlier increase in mortality, which we found in the previous table, is com arising completely from the states which devolved only the health, from the beta one, and they did not devolve functionaries. For those states, we see a pretty large and significant increases in neonatal, infant, and under five mortality rates. Uh, and these are pretty large. These are some of these are 15 to 20% of the mean. So this is, these are quite large effects. If you, if you were a stage which devolved both health and, fun, and the functionaries, the functions and the functionaries, then your total effect is beta one plus beta two. And as you can see in this table, it is not statistically different from zero. So we test whether beta one plus beta two equal to zero, we cannot rule it out. That's why you have this negative significant coefficient. When you add them up, there is no change in this infant mortality rate. So, you know, we don't see, unfortunately, any reductions in infant mortality, which is one of the motivations for this whole decentralization is to improve uh, human development outcomes. We fail to see any improvement. Uh, and if you do it only halfway, then you get a significant uh, worsening. So then we, we do a lot of robustness checks uh, and I will just run through them quickly in the interest of time. I'm not gonna show all of them, but just to show, tell you what we did. Uh, one issue is omitted variables, obviously, and it, in our case, because it's a difference in different specification, we are worried only about omitted variables that vary at both state and time. Uh, and so two important things we control for are budgetary, um, uh, budgetary things from the state budget, as, as Monica already asked. So we control for state per capita health spending, state per capita uh, funds to local governments, central government funds to local governments, and all sorts of things. 
So we control for all kinds of budgetary things. It doesn't change our result at all. The second thing we control for is the timing of the gender quota implementation, because many other papers have shown that having more women leaders often improves health outcomes. And so we didn't want our effects to be conflated with that. And we have the timing of that. And we could control for that so it's not some uh, lingering effects of the earlier uh, political decentralization. The second concern, of course, in any difference in different studies is that uh, of differential pretrends. The states that devolved may be on a different trend from states that did not devolve uh, before, even before the reform. So we do these usual types of um, difference in difference graphs, which is the year by year effects. The left hand side graph showing you the beta one coefficient, right? So the vertical line, black line is the timing of the reform. Uh, plus one is one year after, plus two is two years after, et cetera. Minus one is one year before and so on. So if you look at the left hand side graph, none of the coefficients from the before reform period are at all statistically significant. So we don't, so that we don't have, we don't have any evidence of differential pretrends. And you see a pretty large increase in, in mortality right after, this is the beta one coefficient, it um, jumps up right after the reform and it stays relatively um, stable thereafter. Similarly for beta two, this is also interesting because it means that the increase you're observing is not like a temporary thing where they're switching the system from central from state control to local control and therefore there is some temporary dislocation it's not temporary this is five to six years after the reform we see the same rise in mortality it's not going away so that um you know so it's not just some temporary dislocation thing so i think this graph is important for that reason uh, as well so fine then we have a whole bunch of other robustness checks which i'm i won't not show i'll just read through we record various dates. Um, we drop one state at a time. It doesn't matter. We drop households which are listed as visitors. Um, it's, it doesn't matter that. I think the important thing is we run a pretty um, rigorous specification with mother fixed effects. So that means we are comparing births in the same family in the pre-devolution period to births in the post-devolution period. And we find almost exactly the same results. So it's not about selection into uh, who has a child in pre-devolution versus post-devolution. That was one thing we were worried about. Um, we look at the, uh, the recent literature on these heterogeneous treatment effects for the difference in difference estimators. We computed this alternative difference in difference estimator based on both the Dishes, Martin, and Hotefill estimator, but also the Callaway and Santana type of uh, uh, estimator, which uses just the not yet treated units as the control group, not the already treated ones. And in our case, we can do it because seven out of our 25 states still have not uh, devolved. So we have this um, not yet treated units and our results are pretty robust to all of these. Uh, so I want to highlight two things. One is, uh, I think I have a couple of minutes, I will highlight two things. One is whether fiscal de devolution matters. So we already checked that, you know, timing of the political decentralization doesn't matter. What we did is we constructed separate analyses for states which had some fiscal decentralization, that means the local governments are collecting some taxes, uh, and states which don't have any. Uh, and if you look at the uh, columns three and four, it's uh, all the mortality measures show similar results, but if you look at column three and four in, for infant mortality, it's very illustrative. If you have fiscal decentralization, right, we don't see any statistically significant effect on uh, whether you devolved health functions with or without functionaries. There's no significant effect at all. But if you did not have this funds devolution or the fiscal decentralization, then you see that same pattern being repeated. Uh, you see that uh, infant mortality goes up if you have devolved only the functions, but no funds and uh, no functionaries, right? So you're given responsibility to the local governments, but no power over the officials and no fiscal power, right? So it's a responsibility without power is really, really bad. Uh, if you see, uh, if you give, even if you don't have fiscal power, you're given the responsibility over the workers, then you see the negative significant coefficient, the beta one plus beta two is a zero. Okay, so that's, it's, it's literally responsibility without power, which is the, without any kind of power, which is the worst. So I will skip that one and I'm going to, uh, tell you what we're thinking about the mechanism behind this. And I think right now what we can show is that this is not due to other types of things. It's because the quality of the public service actually worsens. And we can show you some various pieces of evidence for that. 
The first piece of evidence I want to show you is that the results are much stronger for those who rely on public services, in particular the poor. So the, the DHS tells us the wealth quintile of each household in the survey, and so we can do these different uh, regressions for each wealth quintile. And if you look at the left-hand side graph here, these are the beta-1 coefficients, right, which is the effect of functions devolution without power without functionaries. And you can see that for the lowest quintile, quintile one, the poorest households, the increase in mortality is really high. While for the richest household is much lower than the poorer households. Uh, and in fact, it's, um, I think, not even statistically significant. Right? So the, and this is, um, and similarly, you see the same pattern for the beta two, this reversal part, right? So basically we don't have, if you devolve functions and functionaries, we don't see an effect on anybody. But if you do only the partial devolution, the poor are the ones who suffer the most. This makes complete sense because India also has a, a robust private healthcare system and richer people obviously are able to pay and access that private healthcare. And so they are not so much affected by how well the public system is doing. So this is all coming from the public health system. We got some measures of actual functioning, a uh, little bit like John Carlos measures, which is they asked the households, did you have many prenatal, three or more prenatal visits? Was a tetanus injection provided? Was iron supplements provided? Did the kid have vaccinations? This is not complete data. We only have an incomplete panel. So it's not as good as the earlier set of regressions, but we do our best. Uh, we find very similar results. Uh, you actually have lower probability of getting the tetanus injection. That's really significant. Uh, marginally significant increase in the fraction of children who don't have any uh, vaccinations. So these are all indicators of the health system not actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. And finally, we did a um, similar type of analysis for education outcomes. Hmm. Uh, for that, we have a different survey, which, is, uh, which uh, gives the education status of people. Uh, and we are looking at primary school completion and middle school completion, because those are the two functions of the education, which was devolved uh, to the local level. Uh, they are not in charge of high schools and colleges and so on. Uh, because of various age restrictions, we cannot do a full analysis. We are only able to examine cohorts which are exposed to devolution year 2008 or earlier, so for various data restrictions. But it's a nice uh, check that it's not just health. Uh, you, in fact, find very, very similar results for education. If you look at column two here, if you are a state which devolved the education function to local governments but didn't provide them any authority over the teachers and other education workers, then you see a four percentage point reduction in primary school completion in the probability that the person completes primary school. Uh, if you provide both of these dimensions of devolution, then the beta one plus beta two is not different from zero. For middle school, we see the same thing qualitatively. What is interesting for middle school is that we see it in slightly opposite. If you devolve only partially, you don't see a statistically significant effect over here. But if you devolve fully, you actually see an increase in middle school completion rates. But again, anything positive is only happening if you devolve both functions and functionaries. So let me just end uh, over here. This is my concluding slides. Uh, so the devolution of health functions worsens child mortality outcomes when it's not accompanied by this devolution of authority over the functionaries. So when both of these are uh, devolved or funds are devolved, there is actually no significant difference. So this is actually disappointing because improving public service was one of the motivations for this whole reform. So we unfortunately are not able to find improvements, but at least we can prevent the worsening by uh, devolving fully. Uh, and we are attributing this to a decline in the quality of public service provisions. It is striking that the education outcomes show a very similar pattern. So they improve only when both functions and functionaries are, are devolved. Uh, we are trying to get some data to look at quantity measures of public service provision, like the number of doctors or teachers and so on. It's, we have got it for a few years. We don't have a full panel yet, but we want to see whether anything changes in that dimension when devolution happens. But I think the main policy lesson is that decentralization policies need to be implemented with a lot of care. So if you give local governments responsibility without power, you can actually make things worse. So that's uh, what I have. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Lakshmi, for a great paper and presentation. So we don't have all that much time for questions, but let me get started um, using my first mover advantage. So. Um, I was wondering to what extent your effects could be um, coming not so much by a change in the government sector and how it operates, but, but by a weakening of political accountability in the sense that once you have this reform, 
um, voters might have a lot of uncertainty about who is responsible of what. And perhaps when you bundle it with the devolution of functionaries or when you bundle it with tax authority, it's much more clear who is responsible for that. I don't know if there are ways to test this, this hypothesis or whether this, uh, this could make sense. Yeah, no, I think it completely makes sense, right? So the question is, why does this divided thing matter? And it could be either, I mentioned some papers which look at, you know, free riding among the different principles and monitoring the workers, or it could be confusion on the part of the voters about who to punish, which leads mm -hmm. to this free riding problem, right? So then people are not bothered. Why should we worry? Because they're going to blame the other, other side. Uh, I don't know how to test it, but it's a good thought to think about whether we can test it using some kind of voting data uh, mm -hmm. about this. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, other questions, comments? Uh, I think then Marco was a slightly earlier raising his hand. One Go second. Um, so so, so my, my question is similar to, to Monica's in, in, in the sense uh, about the interpretation of, of this result, right? So, so you, you're attaching the interaction term a very precise uh, interpretation in terms of, of monitoring and functionaries and so on. But, but from at least from the way I I understood the the devolution, it, it could also be just that these states cannot get their act together, right? So so it's more more about like management capacity uh, in in general rather than the the specific so the lack of assignment of, of functionaries or, or functions to to people is just a symptom of a more general lack of, of management capacity. Uh, of, of the state, no? and, and one way that you can test it is is by by, by looking at general management capacity uh, measurements. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure yeah. if you, there's data. Well, that's, we, that. We've been struggling to think of a good measure uh, of management capacity, but that's a good thought. We should think about how to measure mm -hmm. it because we didn't want to use just average measures like education level of the state. But that's not correct no 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 i was thinking of something about uh, whether you manage to submit your budget on time uh, yeah. like co comply with, with basic administrative uh, administrative tasks yeah um, yeah that's a good point we can check whether they hold elections on time for instance or as you say pass the budget on time yeah that's a good thought hmm. okay juan felipe Yes. Um, so I, I have a question. Uh, it's more related to like if you had the opportunity to look at other outcomes mm -hmm. that unrelated uh, with this. I'm a bit surprised with the persistence of the effects. Uh, I was expecting that yeah. at some point, it, once you have the decentralization, uh, there's some adjustment and you have you have some costs uh, related with that. But then you have a, like a catch up effect that at least uh, not uh, consistent with like the same effect over time for six yeah. years. Right? So I was thinking in, in something um, related to like probably looking at other outcomes and see if there is something else going yeah. on. Yeah, no, so one of the, that's a good point. I mean, I think we were thought it's, a, we've also what, wanted to believe that it's a temporary effect. It unfortunately doesn't go away. So it seems to be a permanent feature of this institutional change. It's not like a transition cost you're paying. One of the things we want to look at uh, in particular actually is roads because roads were also supposed to be devolved to the local government. And the timing, I think, was slightly different from the health and education. We're still putting together the data set because it reads so many documents to find the correct date at which they devolved the roads. But that could be another um, sort of outcome to look at. So uh, related to this, actually, I was thinking that I was also surprised to find this uh, persistent effect. So. Uh, for those uh, states where perhaps they um, adopted this functional revolution a few years later, could you kind of see whether for them the, the, the positive effect decays precisely at the time when they adopt this subsequent reform and, and related to this, you know, the dynamics, not only of the, of the first evolution, but also see if it's, it goes away when you implement all these other yeah. reforms. We can check that. Our dates of functionary devolution are not super precise for all the states, but for the states where we have the precise date, we can actually check that. But for most, I think for most states, what we've read so far is they did it both together. So either they, it was like more, you did it or you didn't do it. So, it, you know, I think it's very interesting why they chose not to do the functionary devolution. It could be some issue of state specific capacity. So, in one mm -hmm. sense, they actually got the act together to devolve the functions, which is great mm -hmm. because. 
you know, you're, you're actually in violation of a constitutional amendment if you don't do it. So in fact, mm -hmm. it's the states who didn't do any devolution were kind of, I would say the worst managed, so to speak, yeah. because they are violating the constitution. And they are, despite all these nudges also from the central government, they're still not doing it for 20 years. Uh, on right. based on the results, of course, it may be that they are right not to do it. <laughs> so. Right. Okay, thank you. Last question from Melanie. Uh, so, um, so yes, and so my main question, I guess, is just um, because you mentioned, I think, as well, um, about if you have those services provided very locally, it will probably be more expensive. And then you also said that the budget has stayed the same. So I was wondering, um, so does that mean that if the government was able to control the costs some other ways, then th there would not be as much of a negative effect, right? Because in the absence of any other adjustment, it sounds like it will surely be a negative effect just because the same budget will not be as useful uh, given the service is more expensive now. So then you will have to have some adjustment on some other dimensions. And then yeah. I think we that's, check, yeah. yeah. So that's a good point. We check the dimensions of the budget most related because we check the health budget and the education budget. But maybe we should check some other parts of the state budget. So in particular, the budget deficit is worth uh, looking at. Yeah, I think, yeah, um, I guess unless uh, there is some, uh, um, but I think your point about the functionaries and the, you know, the functions, it, it is in that direction. I was just thinking like, if, if that's just like a very straightforward way, it's just, uh, you have to, be, so for example, cut some staff members since now everything else is more expensive and then you know have one hospital per village is probably more expensive than having like a big big hospital for like 10 villages or yeah. something and then if you're able to cut some staff members is that is right. that is that why right so no, that's exactly that's why when we have mm -hmm. the staffing data finished that's exactly what we want to look okay are there staffing cuts for instance huh? i don't know yet because so, we're still putting together that data mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks, uh, Lakshmi, for a great uh, another great paper and presentations, and thanks for everyone's comments. So let's take now a very quick break of seven minutes. Uh, you're free to leave the the session open, uh, and we'll be back uh, in seven minutes. Okay, thank you. All right. So perhaps we should uh, resume. Melanie, are you there? Yes, I have um, I've come back and um, I, I hope all, everyone can see my slides. I think it's already, yes, we can. Yes. We can hear okay. you well. So the floor is yours. All right. Uh, so thanks for inviting me. Um, this is joint work with Bo Xiao Zhang and he's also here today. So if you have questions, um, just tap into the, the chat window and then he will be able to answer them. Um, so, um, so we'll give a, a very brief overview of um, of the like the background, also uh, the, like both the historical and the project of background. So this is a project that we've been looked at for a while, and more recently we've been able to add like a set of data which I think no one else has used before. So I'm very excited to talk about them today. Um, and then, so this is a project to tie into this. Uh, this like, recent you know, sort of recent interesting in trying to think about the historical economy, but you know, especially in couple countries like China, both is a, a still developing country today, but then have like a relatively long written history, uh, which you know, sort of a country has been studied um, until quite recently. So we are thinking about, you know, so first starting with this imperial examination system, which is something might deserve a few words if you haven't heard of it before. And then more specifically examine a reform, which resembles the modern affirmative action. Later on, I will explain uh, why there is this resemblance and then what can we make use of that and then after this reform then we have also the data available for the next two or three hundred years which then allow us to actually examine the effects of those policies um so most most of you might be aware that the affirmative action policies and in the western sense is, is a relatively recent phenomenon which means we don't really get to study any of the long-run outcomes even if we want to so then this is the basic setup of a project that we have um, and thank, thankfully, and a written history on, of this, uh, which describes this system quite well, even though there is many other shortcomings, but then can make use of this available data and study some of the questions that is of general interest. So the system itself, again, um, so it's a few things about China is kind of interesting um, to many you know, observers. One is it actually has a quite high level of human capital. So this is probably even true today when you see you know, even ordinary people 
from very ordinary background, they so, sort of somehow get, has, has both a quite high level of education and, and is willing to uh, achieve even more. And, and then there's speculations on why things are this way, and there could be a wide range of explanations. But one of those explanations has boils down to this oh, ancient system, uh, not ancient, but sort of uh, no, a, a thousand year old system at least, that is uh, allowing individuals to achieve those uh, pretty high ranking government jobs uh, by taking this exam. So to do this exam, it will require years of investments in, in getting a basic education and also be able to read and write very well. And then I guess the question then is, um, you know, given this assistant, which obviously played a quite important role uh, in the social context at the time, and it is uh, individuals are able to access a range of opportunities by uh, passing the exams. Uh, what happens when there is major reform uh, to how those individuals are selected? And then we look at this reform in 1712. Right? This reform is, is kind of a, uh, is quite phenomenal in, in several ways. One is it changed, it shifted towards a much more localized version, uh, even though the exam is essentially governed, but then the competition became much more localized. So before, if an individual wants to pass the exam, it has to do better than uh, everyone else from the country and then later everyone else in their uh, the larger region, uh, which China has three of those. But then after 1712, uh, it suddenly it, it just needs to compete with everyone from their own province. So then it changes the rule, which is controversial in many ways. I think for the same reason why affirmative action policies could be controversial today, um, because it implies that it would not be the same standard. And then for the system, and it continues to have, um, because it's a, it's, it's a form to this imperial examination system, which has this three degrees, matches the three tier system. And then the, the reform actually only uh, tackles the very top tier, which then makes it quite convenient because we don't have to think about, oh, this is a reform that applies to all educational levels, uh, but we boast the education and labor markets, then you wouldn't know where this effects come from. So it is a relatively simple reform and in the sense that it just affects how this, the top degree, highest degree candidates are, are selected. And then the core of the gist of this, and as I said, is just you have a, a more of a confined pool of candidates that uh, participated in this um, is being compared with each other and, and then how the decision was made finally. And more also important point is usually you know, the difficult or challenge faced by studying anything in the long term is that people obviously inevitably move, especially when we think about a, a reform like this, it will create like, plenty of opportunities for arbitrage because you know, it's a province or region based, the pace based reform. And there's a, uh, in, the, in the modern context, it, it would seem like there was no reason why individuals wouldn't just move somewhere and the exams is easier. But uh, well, in our particular context, this is uh, not as a, a major of a concern uh, for, for various reasons uh, due to you know, having the, the clan system, but also just government has been a very demanding of who is considered a, as a resident. Um, so usually this takes you know, three or four generations to be in one same place um, until their candidates can then take the exam uh, as a local resident. Okay, so um, just a, a, a bit more of a, a details on the reform. I, so from the perspective of the emperor, he is uh, the decision maker at the time. So what concerns him at the time uh, is that he observed this emperor exams became more popular. Right? So initially there was a, a short depressed period due to the, the, you know, the war between the, the new rulers and the, the pre-existing uh, the, the high population, but this was no longer a problem by the time he was in power. And then he observed there's a lot of participation or demands for, for this type of exams, but the success rates varied uh, greatly across different parts of the country. So there are parts of the country where candidates were generally less prepared and had a, not, doesn't have as much of a, a tradition of uh, engaging in this, uh, in this system or competition. And then those candidates almost never succeeded. So to him, this is a problem. You can think of this as a problem on multiple levels. It could be a, a direct threat to the political stability. Since this institution is already, by this point, uh, you know, enshrined as like a you know, system of equality or you know, opportunities. So he would not uh, really want it to uh, have you know, this been a source of uh, later issues. And he decided that the one way to do this is then just to divide them into different polls and, and set different standards or well, to put um, to be exact in uh, the standards or just be uh, to make this being uh, make the acceptance rates the same but 
it will be then by the province only. Then I think it's quite clear that if a province, everyone comes from this province is uh, is having a lower score, then it would just be easier to, to pass the exam coming from that province. So in terms of the literature, so there's a expanding literature, not no affirmative action. Um, so a lot of the recent, recent literature is uh, more empirical in nature. It shows there is a, a benefits for the, the, the disadvantaged group, uh, which I think is you know, the intended goal of affirmative action in, in any case. And then uh, some of the uh, literature also shows that today we're also uh, not only they um, not only they benefited from it, but just by having like a shared number of those candidates of representation uh, from those groups, but they also did better afterwards. So there isn't really a trade-off between like the quality and the uh, uh, and, and the quality in that sense. Um, and then I think there's also this paper, it's a slightly early on paper, uh, which we will also be able to speak to is this work, uh, which is uh, what, what, what about within those groups, you know, within the targeted groups, um, since you know, ultimately we care most about the group, the subgroups or the individuals who are the least advantaged, and, um, but is that, even, uh, is that even a possibility to also help out those individuals with those type of policies? And then when we put the formative action um, in the historical context, so there are several things we we'll have to, to overcome. Uh, one is just like the definition of itself. It is very complicated. It, it changes and evolves uh, very quickly. And even just from uh, 2010 to 2020, there's already a different slightly different definition of affirmative action. Uh, but one common denominator is that it usually describes policies that is uh, intended to improve the position of those underrepresented and the disadvantaged groups, and same as our policy in, in the 1712. And this, so far in terms of the literature, I mean, the evidence is mixed on, on the effects of those policies. So as I said, the empirical work, um, it has been more recent ones has shown uh, positive effects. But if you know, read the seriatic literature, it would usually suggest that you know, there should be a pretty obvious negative effects uh, I think it doesn't, it's not very difficult to think why could, there could be, but it's a, mostly a concern about the efficiency of the reform. So for our purpose, we, um, we, we think of this as a, as a policy that just you know, artificially changes the, the standards or the, the criteria for, for individuals based on their, uh, their affiliation, um, ultimately. So they have comes from a different group, then they will have a, a different, they have to pass the exams, but with a very different score. And for the country, um, then it's, it's tied to this sense of proto-egalitarianism and some concerns for um, this fairness and also this political stability. Um, although I think this is one thing to caveat is, um, although the system does channel the candidates into the bureaucracy, but it doesn't, it's, it has no direct links to um, institutions of political representation or, or political patronage. So those are the things we were not going into. Uh, so I'd like to clarify our con contribution. Um, so, uh, so first, this is a reform. Uh, we, it is a, a very large scale policy experiment with uh, generalizable insights into questions in labor, public economics. So those are where, where this affirmative action is being studied right now. And then we will think of this as a, also a rare opportunity to examine human capital accumulation over the whole duration, the entire duration of this policy, but also long after the policy itself. And we have some pretty good data on the examination performance and professional outcomes of those uh, of those candidates and then many cohorts of them like for the time when the entire 200 years after after the reform we have those data um, and that provides some opportunity to look at the out actual outcome of, of those policies and then we are also able to shed some light on how the schemes were distributed which i think is a, a, a less studied area um, even though there is a paper by Marina Bochan and in, in 2010. Um, okay, so uh, so in terms of so the data- Melanie, uh, can yeah. I ask you a clarifying question? Sorry. So you said that the number of available positions is proportional to the number of applicants, right? So uh, that, the participants, yeah. Of participants, right? So mm -hmm. that's not directly telling us that this is pro for affirmative action, no? It's a richer, probably the richest provinces uh, applying like in mass, you know, like massively, they are going to have more slots. 
yeah. Uh, so, so the part participant side, uh, I think it's worth maybe it's worth going back to uh, the slides here just to explain the system a little bit more. Um, so this is like a three tier system. So participant participation is not not like a decision can be made easily. So it's it's some it's only the qualified candidates. So people have to pass like the first two tiers of exams first. Uh, but yeah. So it um so the inform is mostly just trying to make it. I guess slightly more even than before. It's still not going to be like fully proportional to the population in that province, even though mm -hmm. that is a consideration as well. But I think the main thing is to making sure that at least it's proportional to how many who come to take the exam. Uh, and it's okay. important to note that it's it's not like I just show up and I take the exam. It has to be someone who already passed the first two tiers of exam already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, so uh, so yeah, so then I just like briefly speak to the uh, about the data. Um, so we have about um, um, so most of analysis. I, I think we're concerning this three, two, three, three levels of administration. Right, so it's a country with eighteen provinces and two hundred sixty-seven prefectures and sixteen. Uh, 52 counties altogether, and then uh, the panel data. Right, the part we can look at the the performance through the outcomes before and after. It is mostly just for the period um, you know, before and after the reform in this between the 1650 and 1840. And then we also look at when the policy was phased out because the policy eventually became irrelevant in 1905. Um, and then it is also going to be a very different system. There's no longer imperial exams, but there were still going to be other type of exams that select the talent. And then we look at um, in the period after that, uh, both the social and educational elite. So the educational elite were just going to be people who did very well in the exams and then get into like the selective universities. But the social elite is going to be more broad and just anyone who is famous or notable. And then also there's the literacy and the educational attainment of, of the general population. So also curious you know, if the system has any uh, spillover effects, which you know, it should be because every time we in the past, you see one, one successful candidate at the top level exam. It's usually you know, people who have a much larger base and, and, and below. So they are already going to be like, you know, a thousand people participate in the lowest level exam. And then only like 10 of them pass the, the, the second level. And then eventually like one person wins. Uh, so there, there could be, there could be some particularly down of, of this policy as well, just because of the structure of this examination system. So unfortunately, the historical records on the candidates who attended but never passed the exam did not survive. So we do not know who, who actually attended this exam. Though we do know roughly like, what is the level, what is the um, people who passed the exam at the lower level. Um, then think about the participants is always going to be uh, coming from that, that poll of lower level exams. So then we started to try to quantify this reform because we don't really know what, what is the like, magnitude of the reform. Like the reform itself is just a change in the rule. The rule says that before that you compete with a lot of people and now you only compete with people who come from the same region as you, uh, same province. Um, and then what we do is in trying to compare the share of those province um, in the region before and after the um, before the reform and the right after the reform. So the right after the reform between I think this should be like 1713 and 1730, and then just the period before the reform or way before the reform, but way before the entire like, like a panel period we're looking at. And then this gives us some sense about um, who are the beneficiaries from this reform and how much they benefit it. So plot this onto the this example, I'll skip, um, but I'll plot this onto the map, right? So first, this is the three regions. So that's like the pre-existing system we have, right? So there's already some idea about having the country spread into three broad regions um, because there are some also differences just across those big regions. But then afterwards, um, those regions within those provinces, right, within the regions, there's also individual provinces. They begin to uh, see this chain, the, the share, their share either increase or decrease relative to everyone, every other province in, within that region. And then we can use that as a as an um, indicator of what is the intensity of this reform um, to those individual provinces. And then using that, and then we can continue to look at and how it would be the impact of this reform on those individuals, and especially because what we data, what our data have is you know, people who pass this exam, and especially um, we'll be curious about how does that affect those individuals who pass the exam, but from those more underrepresented provinces. 
Uh, so to do that, we just run on, uh, we, 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 we do this estimation and we're trying to compare this performance of, and also professional outcome of the successful candidates, both before and after the reform. And then we find there's no evidence there is a decline, at least not a long lasting decline in the quality of those candidates, uh, which, which I think is actually quite interesting because I mean, if you think about very simple mindedly, then you know, from the theoretical point of view, there could be a reason for them to, uh, to, to for the, like the worst candidates to be selected, at least in the short run. But we find this is not the case that at least in the, when you look at the, like 100 or 120, up to 120 years after the reform, there is no uh, such things of having those uh, candidates, the worst candidates come in those provinces just because of this reform. Uh, so if that, uh, just to uh, be a bit more concrete about the estimation uh, strategy we have. So we have uh, on, the, on the left hand side, they have this rank, which is either the exam rank or the government rank, uh, which are both measures of their quality. Um, and then, but also the, um, the, the indicators, variables, um, of the measures of the reform intensity, both this G um, and the, the L, right? It stands for this provinces that actually benefited or gained the share. And the L stands for those provinces that lost the share um, after the reform. And then the interactive demo is the post variable. So we can see how do they uh, uh, varied after after the, the, the reform. And then we can include some of those controls uh, so we don't have to worry about those systematic trends and, um, in the, the province level after this reform. Um, yeah, so that's mostly. So Melanie, can I ask a clarifying question? So in a sense, your measure of uh, intensity is to some extent endogenous no? because the reform could also have affected the number of participants, right? So. How do you think about that? Wouldn't it be better to measure, to, to use a measure of intensity that predicts eventual intensity, but not the endogenous uh, change in intensity? Yeah, so we are struggling a lot with this measure. Um, so the idea of this is right now is we look at very in the very short term, because in the very short term, this is actually pretty rigid. You know? It's pretty inflexible so because of the participants can has to draw, come from the same pool of people. And because also there's no, no other reforms to the people who pass lower level exam, which is strictly controlled by a quota. Uh, but yes, so in, in some sense, if you think, if we worry about the, the pool of the participants as a response to this reform, and then this is in fact something we would like to capture, right? So I don't know what exactly you're thinking, but I'd like to hear more about this afterwards. But we are interested in how does the participants suggest both by like participate more or increasing the effort. And in fact, if without those adjustments, there shouldn't be any reason there, the quality of them that's not decline. It would just be like, you know, has to decline if it's like the same people who participate before and after. So there's right. two things. One, one is we do worry about it. Like, you know, if you look at the, you know, the entire period afterwards then surely it will be endogenous, but look at the right afterwards, at least we capture the moment when the reform happens and then how does that change who comes from where. But at the same time, we um, like eventually we don't worry about the participants uh, because that would be part of the, the outcomes we would like to capture. But I think I know you. I understand your question. But yeah, so I, I think this is unfortunately, you know, because there's very few people succeeded in every exam. Otherwise, you can just like one exam. Like, but unfortunately, mm -hmm. there's only like a few people for each exam. So we do look at at least two or three exams, and hoping that there is minimal adjustments within such a short time. Okay. And uh, yeah, so um, so then we just briefly over and review those results. So when is um. For the exam ranks, I think if those candidates come from a, a province that benefited from reform, and then in fact their rank like in the exams slightly improved over the course of the 120 years after the reform, and it's less true with candidates. Um, so this is just to to calculate this in the, the province level, uh, taking the you know, aggregated to the province, and it's same same results, similar similar patterns and before. But it is less clear what happens with the professional outcomes. Um, but then what is it is it is still clear though, it is just you do not see a decline, right? So there's not there's nothing is like a systematically a worse outcomes either in the exam or the, the professional outcome side. But we are interested in understanding more about the professional outcomes if possible, because you know this is like the goal of this exam system, and ultimately those people wanted to have a job in the government. Um, the, the fact that they are getting better scores, but uh, um, not actually better 
professional outcome itself uh, could indicate there is there's something else going on. There could be some other type of skills they would actually need, you know, which might come from like the family background or something um, cannot be, uh, is not captured by the exam itself. So that's also possible. Now, for, for the moment, we are just using them as like indicators of the effects of these reforms um, and the candidates that come from the, uh, the beneficiary provinces. And then what we do is, um, so this is just an alternative treatment because you know, we worried about you know, our treatment could be somewhat arbitrary because we're looking at these regions, but you know, we also uh, limit how, how comparable this reform intensity is. Like all the regression that I just showed you or has the region fixed effects just because our, our measure cannot be compared uh, between regions at all. So here we're trying to overcome this, but we do pay a cost because the data is much more limited for the time period where the competition is nationwide, and there's only about 70 years, uh, is, is qualified or can be used for that purpose. But we do it anyways, and, and then we do still find relatively similar results. So we still have uh, exam ranks are being uh, improving afterwards, and then government ranks not as much. And then we look at the distributional consequences of the reform because something is also ultimately, if we wanted this reform to not just increase the, um, uh, the position of the groups, but also the actual individuals within those groups, then I think the distribution questions is inevitable. So we would like to know how those gains were shared. Um, we do, we can't really look at this in the, um, in the individual, like the very, uh, it's because it's hard to think about how to identify those subgroups or individuals with systematically different characteristics with the, with the kind of data we have. But what we can, what we can do is uh, look at the prefectures, which is the sub-provisional units, or the counties. And then this allows to us to examine um, and to, to, to just basically to show that the distributions of those uh, those uh, those gains and if there's any you know, if there's any pattern systematic pattern in that, and then after we is estimate this impact, um, a variant by this prefecture or sub provincial units pre existing strengths in human capital, and then we, we immediately find that most of these gains appeared to be captured by the prefectures that had uh, the greatest advantage uh, before the reform. Um, I guess in the you know, if we translate this into the, like, the Indian context, so that is the same as saying uh, it is like the, the more social economic, have the individuals with better social economic backgrounds uh, might have benefited from those, those affirmative actions the most. And then uh, to just show why this is necessary, uh, but you can, as you can see, there's just like a lot of heterogeneity even within those smaller districts. In, in terms of their uh, jingshi density. Uh, and then that leads to, uh, it's a very natural question that to how that affected uh, the effects of this review. Um, and then what we find is, if you estimate this with this um, for interaction terms, um, when we can take into account the prefectures pre-existing strengths in human capital, uh, controlling for those both the provincial heterogeneous time trends, but also those prefectural specific trends. And then what we find is um, uh, it is those prefectures are the most advantages um, that seems to gain the most. Um, and for the provinces that has lost some shares or have suffered some losses, and then those those prefectures seems to be able to deal with the losses the most effectively. So they do not see as much of a loss. So in other words, I think if you were in one of those prefectures that also uh, in those in those provinces that has lost some shares, then then you're probably bearing most of the burdens, uh, the negative effects of this report. And then we plot this in the graph, and then it looks you know the same as as the uh, as, uh, as the table results. It's it's you know, it, and the gap is probably has a grow over over time. Right? Instead of thinking of this as it eventually goes away, but it actually was pretty pretty persistent. And then we can do this at the county level and find very similar results. There's no reason to think they will be different because it's a, a very similar uh, mechanism uh, to what we observe in the prefecture level. Um, until when we, we cut the sample um, a bit differently and then started to look at prefectures that with some kind of infrastructure or some, some, of the, some facilities or some additional services to support their candidates. So once we look at that, prefectures that with some funding agencies, as Monica's question about participants again, is very relevant here. Because if you're a prefecture and now the, the exam becomes more difficult for you, 
And then there is also no way to subsidize these candidates. And then it is obviously going to be much more likely for them just to give up. And then gradually, you'll see fewer and fewer people participate, and they will be less successful for those prefectures. So we realized that once you have those funding agencies that explicitly subsidize the travel, then those gap stops uh, uh, cease to exist. And mostly, there is no gap. Um, yeah, so that's, I guess, some good news. Well, even though the, the reform does seem to differentially um, affect different sub-provincial units, but then this, this downside or this side effects is there is also a quite easy cure to avoid it. All right, lastly, so this is something we are able to do with this data set, uh, also just the setup in general, just to observe what happens when this policy eventually went away. So the modern affirmative action policies, uh, it, it is very rare for to phase out those policies, right? There are exceptions such as California, uh, but in general, we, we keep those policies in place. Even though, even after we, we, we withdraw those policies, there's usually some other alternative ways to do it because people would, love, would not like to see them going away. But here we do have this uh, setting in which you know, those policies are signed away in, in, uh, in 1905 um, for like the next 20, 30 years. There is really no uh, considerations for those differences across different parts of the country. People just uh, went into the same exam and then uh, take the highest ranked people uh, to be in those universities. And then what happens and does that mean this reform is just going to be a uh, uh, because the reform obviously is by this point it became irrelevant and does that mean all these benefits we have we, we just we just recorded earlier uh, it's also going to go away uh, so with those questions in mind we, we looked at uh, several things one is just to compare the period just before and after the reform and to see if those beneficiary provinces continue to uh, keep their edge uh, keep their gains in some ways um, the answer is that there does seem to be some reversal. I, I guess, you know, if we compare just the reform just before it was phased out and after, um, and we would, you know, not surprisingly, that the, both of those, a lot of those gains will probably run away. It's not like all the gains will be kept. But at the same time, when we look at you know, uh, this data, you know, from a different angle, uh, just to compare, if we just compare the pre and the post reform, um, successful candidates, uh, then we do notice that this post-reform um, measure is, is more predictive. So in some sense that there is um, there is still effects of this reform. So this effect, the post-reform results, exam performance, this still continue to predict the, the, the new human capital, the human capital that now uh, entered into the more nationwide competition. So it is both ways. So we both find it in an irreversal, which means that part of the schemes were eroded, but then it also does not mean that all the schemes went away. So there is some, it's some continuation of those schemes uh, still, even after the policy. So, so Melanie, you have we, one yeah, minute yeah. left. Oh. Sorry. So this is like a, a one, one more result, which is also still very uh, speculative and tentative, which is something we, we're just trying to figure out if, you know, if, if this reform has any impact on uh, the general population. Um, so supposedly there is, is a relationship between uh, this high level exams and the lower level, uh, lower level and other education levels. But here we actually use this as an opportunity to also partly to show that. Uh, we do observe this general relationship. Um, and in fact, you no, know, this is much more pronounced for, for the first 30 years after this reform. And it eventually it does go away when like this uh, later reform or post reform uh, results is became la la became less relevant. So, yeah. Okay. So I think well, it's time to to wrap up. Um. So we we're trying to write this paper to trying to use this uh this this system, which probably people don't really look at it usually in this way. But we we're trying to be the first to to, to try to be, uh, make this link, and then as able to hopefully generate some of the useful results that is useful for like the larger literature. And uh, we do observe several things. Most is mostly you know is supportive of affirmative action in general, but then also uh, notice some of the uh, the distributional consequences and some of the um, the remedies or the cures for for those problems. Um, and negative consequences. And then uh, lastly, there is a, a continuation of those games um, even after the reform, uh, which I think is mo mostly uh, intended the goal of most of the action policies are also quite central a topic in a lot of debate, um, but we do provide evidence that those games are, it's possible to see those games continuing and enduring and even after this policy was 
uh, was phased out. Right, I think that's all I have. Thank you very much, uh, Melanie. So let me let me start with uh, with uh, with some comments. So I guess that um, it would be maybe you do this in the in the paper. Maybe I missed it, but it would be great to show that the provinces that are better are more benefited by this reform are also like the poorest ones. No, I feel I that yeah, yeah, yeah. you're talking about the affirmative action, but it would be great to get it as close to that because you know the labor literature we think about affirmative action in a very different way and, and related to this. You know, even even that you we could you know like place devil's advocate and even criticize that because if you think about it, sometimes like the poorer provinces might be the most unequal, and maybe actually you know the the, the very rich elite are the only ones that are applying, right? So it's not yeah, yeah. fully direct that it's this. You know, it would, be, it would be great if you could find the background of these people and actually show that this reform leads to really humble backward individuals. Yeah getting to the bureaucracy that would be ideal but i can mm -hmm. see how this might be difficult mm -hmm. and the other comment related to my previous question and, and perhaps you do this but uh, instead of regressing uh, or measuring treatment intensity by this actual change in the share of um successful applicants i will take like the very the pre uh, exam the last mm -hmm. pre exam and then based on that think about how would you predict the share to be different if the reform would have been applied right and that will give you the predicted change in 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 the end in the in these shares right it's like like a very similar paper that does this is the disease and development by darona samoglu right where they use predicted decline in mortality right, uh, on, mm -hmm. on development right so that's that's what i think it will have a very similar flavor mm. okay. uh who was first i think luis right uh thank you melanie for this very interesting paper uh my question is the following could you comment a bit more on your finding about no impact on the actual job that mm. they have because to some extent your you know the the finding on like class rank seems a bit mechanical like you're giving a boost to these people from these provinces so, okay they look better they but don't we care a bit more about about you know their how they do down the line and is, is it a bit surprising that there's no action there yeah we are a bit surprised i mean i think it's actually even more more surprising than you thought because given this system there should be a, like almost a linear relationship because people are getting placed based on their exam rank at least their first job and even so uh when you look at the um, obviously those are all, like eventual outcomes eventual positions so it's not their first jobs in, in any case but still we're surprised yeah we're surprised there is a, a discrepancy between the exam rank and the the the, the, the government rank the eventual jobs uh but that said i do i do need to clarify that um uh, these are among the people who um, who getting those uh among the people who succeeded right so in some sense like it's it's still good news for this policy itself because now you have many more of those people succeeded so that's like the first order of facts and here we're just showing you among those people who who passed uh getting jobs then is there a quality increase or decrease and the prior right um, it would actually be there should be a decrease because now you have a lot more of those people right if if holding constant to the, the actual the actual you know, candidates or the poll and um, this is already better than 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 the theory we predicted yeah great lakshmi um yeah i have two questions one is one is i may have missed it but are you actually able to look at that extensive margin which monica mentioned which is how mm -hmm. many candidates take the exam at any level it doesn't have to be at the gene level but at the lowest level or do you have any information on that in that interview no, period or? not really i mean but i think thankfully though i mean i guess the idea would, but the fact that we know that there's a there's a percentage of people who take the exam right we can just mechanically like multiply the number who, that's true <laughs> you can but it's, post, it's, post. Yeah. But, pre, yeah. but you don't have pre. we don't have yeah it, there's no actual documents on who Okay, um, they don't record how many yeah. people took the exam. Okay. Yeah. Um, the second thing I was wondering is, you know, your last aggression looking at the persistence. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not sure that that is using the reform properly um, mm -hmm. because it's just looking at post reform versus pre reform. Mm -hmm. um, so, number one, first, it was not clear to me whether the people, the provinces that gained from the reform actually equalized to the provinces that 
uh, were already ahead, right? Because they told as a percentage of the applicants, but as a percentage of population, then it's still not have gotten equalized. And I think the more non-trivial part of the result is that there is a within province inequality created by this affirmative action system. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering whether you could measure that in the post-1905 period when the, the thing is not, so it's, it's more like the dynamics of the inequality because there you know you have a kind of exogenous source of increase in inequality in the historical period. This is this exam reform. And then does it persist? Rather than look, you see what I mean? Then you can actually yeah. compare the gainer provinces from the loser and the loser provinces or both. I mean, the point is it increased within province inequality in both, which is quite interesting. Yeah, I think then, um, so initially, like, when we wrote this paper, we actually quite captured or quite intrigued by this within province thing, right? Because it's obviously, it's also easier to identify in many sense. But then the problem is we also wanted to also write a paper that actually answers the question people have for affirmative action, which is still mostly about, you know, if this is effective and if it increases, I guess, you know, the deep question is it, it, it stimulates uh, and any investments in the human capital and education. Um, so then we decided we should still going to focus on those questions first. But uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think it's it's actually a valuable opportunity because, as you said, it's exogenous increase in, in this inequality within the province, and we'd like to know what happens in you know, hundred years after. Yeah, so I, I think it's yeah maybe we can still talk about them <laughs> even though we have other things. It could it could become yeah. two papers. Yeah. One could be on the. Yeah, that, that's also a good. Point. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> inequality dynamics yeah sorry i have a, a quick question so um do we do we know anything about what motivates the reform itself yeah and um sorry, one, finish, and yeah. Then, yeah and then the second one is um mm -hmm. if you can point to evidence of externalities you know human capital externalities like because the goal of having those policies is that you want um, you know, successful people from under underrepresented groups to set an example for the whole group. If, if some kind of indirect evidence of this, I think it's something that will speak to the literature. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that's true. Yeah. Um. I so the human capital question. I answered so the first question first. Um. So the first question in terms of its motivations. So in the appendix, we eventually need to add like a quite big section on this because this is a time when um when you have this mainstream transition, which the, the incoming elites, I, so for a long time, upset the majority because the majority are not happy with having this new ruler and not happy with its identity. So um, so the example are quite, quite important, right? Um, but it's, <laughs> so, but there's more complicated issues than this because it's also dealing with a problem on the frontier. <laughs> because on the frontier, you have a clear, I think it's more like a question, it's a clear difference in, in um, in uh, almost all dimensions. So they were like poor or more remote. They're simply being further away from the capital. So it's harder to take the exams. So, so a lot of this is that. And then there's also the areas that have the uh, highest probability to just like, to, to like have revolts or, and create problems for the rulers. So I think I think that political stability, um, it is always in mind of those imperial rulers and it's not ex no exception. There's no exception in this case. And then also in terms of the, the more elite level and thinking about the, the more local elites. Um, yes, so I think they wanted to make sure people were actually interested in it. <laughs> so if they just like, because the whole system it was set up also partly to, to keep you engaged. So then you're not like thinking about doing something else that can threaten the state. Um, and then, but, but this new ruler is not as successful as marketing itself because now you're like, you know, the old region was, all those intellectuals were very clear that they do not want to collaborate. So by making the exam extremely difficult and like, almost hopeless for some parts of the country, we obviously will not help, right? So I think that's, that could also be part of the reason. Yeah. But I think the human capital externality question is, is really important. Um, the local elites, and once you have more of those people coming from the poorer parts of the country, um, would that also systematically transform the, the local economy and maybe I can building the communities? Uh, one externality is probably making the country more uh, more loyal to the state, I would say. It's probably not the kind of a transactionality you want, but that, that probably also is, is part of the effect. So we would totally admit to that, yeah. Okay, thank you, Melanie, and for the rest of participants for another great paper and presentation. So let's uh, move to the next project. 
um, Luis Martinez is going to present a paper on the Bourbon reforms. So Melanie, can you share your screen? Yes. Okay, the floor is yours, Luis. Uh, thank you, Monica and Leonard, for, for accepting our paper. Thank you all for, for joining. This is joint work with Giorgio Cubelli from the University of Montevideo, Leopoldo Ferguson from Los Andes, Juan David Torres, who is currently at Stanford, and Felipe Valencia from UBC. Giorgio is currently in the audience, so he may be able to answer some uh, clarifying questions in the chat that you may have. Now, the, the big question that our paper speaks to has to do with what are the historical origins of state capacity in the developing world? I don't think it comes as a surprise to this audience if, if I say that by now we have strong evidence that suggests that the state's ability to perform basic functions such as raising revenue or protecting people's lives or property is an important contributor uh, to long run development. Now, many views on state capacity see it as a gradual process of build up or accumulation which suggests that a particularly fruitful approach to studying state capacities from a historical uh, perspective. Now, of course, we, we don't mean to say that we're by no means the first ones to, to study the historical origins of state capacity and fiscal capacity in particular, but we, we would argue that previous research has been largely focused on Western Europe and has been strongly influenced by the work of, of Charles Tilly. And this idea that you know the state makes war and war makes the state. And so we think that an interesting question that has been left somewhat unanswered is whether this type of view, this type of narrative applies to say the colonial world. Now, what makes the colonial world unique? There are several important features. First, rather than talking say about small city, state, city states in Central Europe, we're talking about these distant, extensive and diverse territories, hundreds and thousands of miles away. We're also importantly talking about an environment in which there will be a limited role for inclusive political institutions and where efforts at state building will, all, will always be kind of imposed from, from the outside. And of course, while in small city states in, in Central Europe, there is a strong connection between the taxation that you're asking for and the public goods that you're delivering, you know, we're fighting this army that is standing right outside our gates. Here, the, it will be much more disjointed the connection between kind of the taxation and the use of the money. So, so we think that, that those are interesting dimensions. The specific question that we aim to answer concerns uh, the introduction of a system of intendants in the Spanish empire, uh, in its American colonies in the late 18th century. Now, this system of intendants is considered by historians to be the cornerstone of this wider program known as the Bourbon reforms. And it basically involves a radical overhaul of, of, the, of the local colonial government. So I, I would like to think that, that Monica and Leonard in their wisdom put the program together seeing these links, but I think it's interesting because the reform that, we'll, that we will be talking about touches on several of the topics that the previous papers have covered such as changes to personnel, selection and incentives, but also a, a, to some extent, some territorial reorganization in, in, in public administration, which particularly will concern major cities. So for the most part, the, the system of intendants will affect who governs and at what level outside of these kind of traditional centers of power, you know, the big cities, the, the ports and so on. Our empirical strategy, relies on the staggered rollout of this reform across various parts of the empire uh, in, in the late 17, in the 1780s. Now, the main focus of our analysis is the impact of this reform on fiscal capacity. And for that purpose, we will use granular data from the system of royal treasury that the crown put, put in place. But we will also look at other aspects, other margins of state capacity, uh, recently, we have been uh, collecting a lot of data on maps to try to understand what parts of the empire were known to the crown. Literally, you know, you rule this entire continent. Do you even know what is out there? And so we have these nice data set on what areas are mapped. And so, you know, so the, abil the availability of information, we think of it as another important margin of state capacity. We will also 
importantly, look at uh, legitimacy and law and order. So again, returning to my initial motivation of this is a reform imposed from outside in a relatively extractive system. An interesting question is, OK, you raise fiscal capacity, you raise more revenue, but at what cost? And I'll provide you with several alternative measures of legitimacy and, and rebellion, including naming patterns, indigenous rebellions, and some evidence on secessionist or pro-independence uh, type of insurrection. Now, uh, I'll, I'll skip the preliminary findings since this is a, a relatively uh, short presentation. Our paper you know, sits at the intersection of several literatures in economic history, political economy, development economics. Let me just give you a flavor of what these are. As I mentioned earlier, there is this kind of large literature on the origins of state capacity in Europe, which is very much focused on, on, the, on the Tilly type narrative. There is also you know, a growing and very interesting literature on reform, bureaucracy, and state capacity from a historical perspective, including the colonial world. You know, very interesting word by, work by Luz Marina Arias, Gianni Guardado, uh, Emily Sellers, Ariana Arnaghi, uh, Diana Moreira. An interesting aspect of what we're doing here is that this is a really ambitious, comprehensive reform that takes place not just in one part of the empire, but throughout uh, the, the empire. Of course, we are not the first to study either the system of royal treasuries or the Bourbon reforms. There's a lot of work by historians uh, on this topic. What we bring to the table is the continental scope, looking at it, you know, big picture, some new data that we have put together, and also the use of, of modern econometric techniques to understand the impact of the reform. Now, if you're wondering who cares about the Bourbons 200 years ago, uh, we would like to think that the challenges that the crown faced in the late 18th century in governing its colonies were not that different from, you know, what many developing countries uh, face today. And so we can think of, of the reform that we will be studying as, you know, some type of top level administrative overhaul in a context uh, where you have very large technological constraints, very large informational frictions. And so on. So we think that our paper, you know, speaks to to those types of issues. Okay. So in the remaining twenty three minutes that I have, I will tell you a bit about the background, the bare minimum that you need to know. I'll tell you a bit about the strategy, and then I'll show you uh, a bunch of results. And you know, I'm happy to answer clarifying questions, but more substantive ones we can we can leave for the end. So the first thing that I want to make clear is that. Colonial state presence, you know, the state of the crown, the presence of the crown in the Americas was very weak outside of a couple of large cities where the viceroys were, where the audiencias were. You know, we're talking about this vast and distant empire that extends all the way from present day California to Patagonia in the south. And basically, you know, who runs this place? There's four viceroys one in Mexico, one in Bogota, one in Lima, one in Buenos Aires. Initially, there were only two. And there's a handful of military districts or captaincies. You know, there's one in Yucatan, one in Guatemala, one in Chile. Of course, this is the ancient regime. So, you know, it's a hodgepodge of, it's not like this nicely organized system, but it's kind of a patchwork of different officials in different places. There's approximately 12 audiencias, which are these high courts, where are they located? You can roughly match them to like present day capitals. So, you know, one in Bogota, one in Quito, one in Santiago, one in Lima, that type of thing, one in Mexico, one in Guadalajara. So, you know, that's it. There's the viceroys, there's the audiencias. These people are, are based in these large cities, larger cities. What happens outside of the large cities? Well, there's this, this body of officers known as corregidores. And you know, that is the crown presence at the more subnational provincial level. And in my next slide, I'll tell you everything about the corregidores and, and why the system seemed to not be working well. Now, on the fiscal side, just to give you a quick sense of things, like I said, the crown, as it conquered and colonized the continent, it developed this system of royal treasuries or cajas reales, the oldest of which date back to you know, the, the early 1500s. Of course, where are these treasuries based, they follow the money. So, you know, they are based at, in large administrative centers, ports, mines, relatively populous indigenous towns, that type of thing. Now, where does the crown get 
get its money from. There's mining tax. So, you know, out of every bar of silver, the crown gets a cut. There's taxes on trade, both domestic and external, you know, uh, yeah, uh, trade taxes. There's a couple of crown monopolies. For instance, a very important one is the monopoly on mercury, which is a crucial input for the production of silver, uh, which, which is something that in very interesting work, Francisco Garfias and, and Emily Sellers have studied. And the indigenous communities pay a poll tax. So those are kind of the four main traditional uh, sources of revenue. Now, what about these corregidores, these local officers that kind of run the government outside of the big cities? Well, as you can see from, from this quote from, from Lynch in 1958, you know, they don't get very good press. You know, Lynch describes the corregidores as the very archetype of erring officialdom. Now, why do they do such a poor job? Well, uh, to begin with, these positions are not very profitable. Uh, applicants would often have to pay to bid for these appointments. So they start in debt. And then, you know, you in many cases, if you're a Spaniard, you cross the ocean and you arrive to this tiny town in the middle of nowhere, and you're there for only five years. And basically you have five years to recoup your, your, uh, your investment. Now, to give you a sense of how non-profitable these positions are, look at this figure on the right. So we were able to get some data on the salaries, on the wages of the corregidores in 1610 and almost 200 years later in 1780. And as you can see, you know, these wages had not been updated. And these are just nominal. You know, these wages had not been updated very much. So these officials are heavy, you know, highly underpaid. So how do they make up the difference? Well, it is well known that they implemented a system of forced sale of goods to the indigenous community, something known as the repartimiento. So they would show up to these communities and they would say, you see these 10 cows, they're yours and you have to pay me in six months for them. And this would be vastly overpriced. And also, of course, there was embezzlement of tax revenue. So these people, the, the corregidores, are the ones in charge of tax collection, particularly the indigenous poll tax. So, of course, you know, what they did was they collected the repartimiento at the same time as, as the tax. And so, you know, if people said, I do not have enough money for pay, to pay for the cows, well, they just take a cut from the tax. This is very hard to verify. You know, they tell, they tell the crown later, only there's this many people, that type of thing. And in general, what the historians describe is this uh, terribly abusive and extractive system that, you know, harmed significantly the indigenous communities. And this generated animosity and this generated rebellion. The most prominent of these rebellions being the Tupac Amaru rebellions of the, of the early 1780s, which are, you know, directly targeted at the corregidores and their abuses. So what is the independence reform about? So this system is rolled out between 1783 and 1787. What motivates the reform? So, of course, you know, the Bourbon kings that arrived to Spain in the 1700s are considered to be these kind of, you know, enlightened autocrat type of things. You know, they, they did reforms along various margins. I don't have time to, to comment on all of them. But in general, reform reaches the Americas in the second half of the century. And this is militarily motivated. So, you know, to some extent I said, we're different from Tilly, but, you know, Tilly finds a way to make it its entry here because it, in 1762, the British capture Habana, which is this crucial port. And this is like a wake up call for the crown that says, we have to strengthen our defenses. We have to run our empire better. We have to run our colonies better. And so they start to think, okay, how can we raise more revenue? How can we run these places better? And, you know, the minister of the Indies at the time, a guy last name Galvez says, well, you know, I visited New, Me New Spain, Mexico, this place is terribly run, the corregidores, they are, you know, responsible for a lot of the issues that we face, so we should replace them. Now, the intendants are not an invention of the colonial system, they were a French figure, the Bourbon kings, you know, come from France, and they had already been adopted in Spain in 1749, there's a couple of trials in Cuba and Louisiana. And then in the 1780s, you know, King Charles III tells Minister Galvez, do what you have to do. And he says, okay, let's do this. Now, what, is, what specifically does the reform involve? So the first thing is an entirely new corpse of 
top provisional officers, these intendants, is introduced. There are several important features of the intendants. The first one is a careful selection process. So while the corregidores often would just pay for the position and there was a lot of adverse selection, you know, not a lot of intrinsic motivation, here there's a careful selection process. And in particular, many, most of the intendants are peninsulars coming from Spain. These people are paid much higher wages. So returning to this figure here, you know, the fixed wage that all the intendants get is 6,000 pesos de ocho, which is, as you can see, is way higher than what the corregidores were getting on average. And they're there for an indefinite term, as long as the king wants them to be there. So they have like, a, you know, in terms of stationary bandits versus roaming, roaming bandits, they have like a, a, a longer time horizon. There is also an aspect of territorial consolidation. So basically, each of these intendencias, think of them as a province, corresponds to roughly seven to 10 of the former corregimientos. So you introduce this new layer of government, which is, you know, there's an element of decentralization. These people are gonna be running these regions far from the larger cities, but there's also an element of centralization since you're kind of aggregating upwards. Importantly, if you look at this final bullet point, all of these corregidores are dismissed. You know, so this is incredibly ambitious. You have this whole body of corrupt bureaucrats, you kick them all out and you replace them by a new figure called subdelegates. These subdelegates are appointed and overseen by the intendant. So power used to lie with the corregidores at the very local level. Now you bring it up to the intendants and you just have a lower level of bureaucrats that are appointed, overseen by the intendant. They get a fixed share of the poll tax that they collect and the repartimiento is banned. So as you can see, it's a complicated reform. There's multiple uh, uh, moving parts, but the essential elements involves changes in personnel, both selection and incentive, and also this element of, of territorial reorganization. Luis, can I ask you something? You're not doing great on time, but nevertheless, let okay. me ask. So um, uh, you said that they are appointed indefinitely. So how are these these uh, immediate superiors are going to discipline them or keep control of them? I mean, the idea is that you know there's the viceroy and the audiencia keeping an eye on them. Of course, while there there were a lot of corregidores, there's much fewer of these intendants. And, you know, and the Ministry of the Indies is keeping track on, you know, who's where and they can relocate them. And so the okay. idea is that, that they're under the, the direct control of like the, the higher level. So they're going to be intendants forever, but they can reshuffle them, no? Yes. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, you get sent to a far away place and then you, you're okay. doing a great job. Let me move you to this more important part, that type of thing. So okay, to, to, to speed up and, and improve on my time, you know, we construct these, these kind of new panel data set for the entire empire in the Americas in the late 18th century. We use the administrative data from the treasuries. We weren't the first to collect this. We built on this gigantic effort by Tepaski and Klein and other authors like Pinto. But still, you know, we spent a lot of effort and time harmonizing the time periods, the currency, classifying the individual line items into subcategories, using modern methods to assess for data manipulation, that type of thing. I already told you that we did create some new from scratch data sets, hand coded. This includes biographical information on all the intendants. This includes geographical information on from the universe of maps that are in the archive of the Indies in Seville. And also we created novel measures on the intensity of the pro-independence movement based on hand coding and analyzing thousands of letters from that crucial period in the early 19th century. We have a, a couple of extra data sets. We consolidated data from different sources and created this kind of consolidated transcontinental data set on indigenous rebellions. And we also use, uh, we scrape these massive websites on baptismal records to get uh, information on names and naming patterns, which we will use to have a sense of like sentiment towards the crown. So like I said in the introduction, uh, our empirical strategy basically leverages the staggered rollout of the reform. So the map on the right, the, the little dots correspond to where the treasuries are located and the different shades of blue show you the timing of the reform. So the, the reform is initially introduced in the South, in, in modern Argentina, Uruguay, and so on. It then goes to Peru. It then goes to Chile and Mexico. And it was then supposed to go to Colombia, but Galvez dies 
and King Charles III dies shortly afterwards. So, you know, the reform effort kind of stalls. Importantly, the variation that we actually use is not when the announcement is made that the reform is going to occur, but when the intendants actually arrive to each of the specific provinces, which I think is kind of cool because you can imagine that back then that is highly idiosyncratic. You know, travel times are so long, similar to, to Melanie's setting and so on. So, so there's a lot of idiosyncratic variation in terms of who arrives to which place uh, when. The results that I'm going to show you next come from, from uh, a very standard difference in different specification, where, say, our unit of observation is a royal treasury in a given year or a province in a given year. And we will include unit fixed effects, year fixed effects. And our coefficient of interest, beta, corresponds to a dummy that clicks on when the intendant arrives, when the first intendant arrives. To, to a given province. And you know, in some specifications, we add additional controls to address imbalancing covariates and, and that type of thing. So let me show you some results. So in this plot, I'm showing you the, the event study specification where the outcome of interest, this is at the treasury level, the outcome of interest is the total revenue that that treasury raises. And the x-axis corresponds again to the year in which the intendant that rules over those, that specific treasury arrives. And so what you can see is that the plot suggests a sizable increase in revenue after the introduction of the intendants. Let me show you the table version of this. So here you can see that you know uh, I, column one is our baseline specification, which suggests a 30% increase in crown revenue after the reform. And this effect is robust to controlling for geographical features, you know, latitude, longitude, locational features. Are you close to a river? Are you close to the coast? That type of thing. Uh, controls regarding pre-Columbine pre population, controls regarding these rebellions that were occurring, you know, in the previous decades, uh, other reforms that were occurring at the, around the same time. The takeaway from this table is, a roughly 30 to 35% increase in revenue as a result of the reform. Of course, since the reform hits different provinces at different times, uh, this is the type of setting where a recent literature suggests that the standard dip in dip could be problematic. We run a bunch of, of different alternative estimators and the results look pretty similar. You can kind of see it here. Uh, you know, we do a bunch of different uh, alternative specifications, this, this is quite robust. Now, so this suggests that the intendants were successful at increasing fiscal capacity and raising more money for the crown. Why was this? Well, here's an, a nice set of plots. So here we're showing you for each treasury, what is the distance to, you know, to, to the crown? And so in panel A, if you compare, say, if we think of the intendants as the representative of the crown compared to, say, the viceroy, you can see that before the reform, many of these provinces were thousands of kilometers away from their viceroy. Once the intendants arrive, you know, that distance collapses and, and is reduced sharply. If you look at compared to the, to the audiences, you get a similar result. So this is just, you know, descriptive evidence that suggests that state presence in these areas farther away from the traditional centers of power improved. Why am I showing you this? Well, here's the evidence from the maps. So the figure on the left is showing you what areas were mapped. And so I, I find this to be very interesting because again, you're running this empire. Do you even know what is there? And the event study on the right is showing you that after the intendants arrived, the availability of maps, in particular, the percent, the, the share of, an, of a province for which a map is available increases. And in fact, you know, anecdotally, many of these maps do say maps submitted by Sen Senor Intendant Luis Martinez from province, blah, blah, blah. Like literally this is, this is part of, of what they're trying to do. Now, why am I emphasizing this territorial aspect? So in panel A, in this next figure, I'm showing you that the effect is concentrated in quartiles. It, this is heterogeneous effects based on fiscal income before the reform. And so as you can see, the places that were producing the most revenue pre-reform, there's very little change there. So basically the crown wasn't doing that bad of a job, you know, in the mines, in the ports, in the big cities, but it is in, in this kind of neglected, farther away places where most of the action is. 
And you can further see this in panel B, where we do heterogeneous effects based on distance to the capital of the intendencia. Of course, similar to, well, not as, as extreme as, as in Lakshmi's setting, these intendencias are also huge. And the historians do say that the intendants sometimes struggle to you know, cover the whole thing. And so you can see that the action is concentrated relatively near to the capital, where the intendant you know, is, is better able uh, to operate. Now, as I said, we, we hand collected biographical data on the intendants. Do they have a military background? Do they have a noble background? Where were they born? That type of thing. And there's only one dimension that seems to matter for their performance in terms of raising revenue. And that is the second one here, which is, it is the peninsulars, the Spaniards, the ones that do a good job and raise more revenue. Now, what we think is going on is that of course this, you know, the, the crown had neglected the empire for decades and for centuries. And so of course this had allowed for a lot of elite capture by Creole uh, elites. And so these now there's these peninsulars that come in and they disrupt this whole system of, of elite capture. So that I, we think that that's what this suggests. Now, again, this is, this is a highly extractive system. So when, when we take the whole network of treasuries and we calculate the total surplus that is generated, revenue minus expenses, you can see that the reform period is associated with a lot of money, you know, with a lot of surplus revenue that is being sent back to the metropolis or to the Philippines or to somewhere else. Of course, again, thinking about like our motivation at the beginning, this suggests, okay, you are extracting a lot more, raising more revenue, and most of this or a big chunk of this is just leaving the system entirely. So how do people respond? Let me spend my last four minutes on this. So, you know, uh, am I right in four minutes, Monica, or am I messing up my... Are you gonna ask a question? Sorry. Okay, okay. So, you know, uh, uh, narratives about state capacity also emphasize lack of conflict you know, think about Adam Smith's famous quote about, you know, peace and lack of war, you know, peace and low taxes is all that is needed for prosperity, Max Weber's ideas, and also more recently the work by Besley and Person. As I have been emphasizing throughout in the Tilly narrative, the development of the fiscal apparatus comes hand in hand with the development of inclusive political institutions. While here, that is not the case. So what do we expect to happen? Well, the historical records suggest that the reform had heterogeneous effects across different groups in colonial society. As I mentioned earlier, the indigenous population had been massively abused and exploited by the corregidores. So to some extent, the indigenous population is better off. But for the Creole elites, the reform implies a loss of privileges and a loss in participation in the colonial government. Again, most of these uh, intendants are, are peninsulars. And, and so, what are the consequences of this? So let me show you some results. So in this table, we are using our data on indigenous rebellions. And what I'm showing you is that the arrival of the intendants, you know, the reform seems to be associated with a reduction in indigenous uprisings, no matter whether you measure this in the level or just a dummy for the extensive margin or the log, you know, for, to account for nonlinearities in line with the historical narrative, in line with the Tupac Amaru you know, grievances, the intendants arrive, there's less abuse, indigenous communities seem to be happier. What about the Creole elites? So here is kind of a soft measure of, you know, of, of support for the crown, which is how often do people name their children, their boys uh, with the name of a viceroy? You know, kind of the viceroy is thought of as the representative, the, the highest level representative of the crown. And what you can see, if you want, I can show you the event study for this, is after the reform occurs in the places where the intendants uh, arrive, people become much less likely to name their children after viceroys, which you know is, is not a smoking gun, but it's suggestive of growing grievances against the crown. So Luis, you now, have about one minute left. Perfect. So. The holy grail to wrap this up is to understand, you know, the reform occurs in the late 1780s. 
but just around the corner in, in, the, in the early 19th century, the, the entire system collapses and all of these countries become independent. Is there a connection between these things? Now, you know, there's, there's limited data availability that hinders our efforts at understanding this. But one thing that we've been able to do is we found this collection of letters sitting again in the archive of the Indies in Seville uh, that are letters connected to the independence period, letters that say a viceroy sends to the crown or that an intendant sends to the viceroy, you know, all of these different things. And we sat down and for each letter we coded what the events that are being described, where did they occur? And you know, what is their nature? Sometimes it's kind of a fiscal thing. Sometimes it's like a very bureaucratic thing, like, hey, we need more supplies of this. But sometimes it's like, hey, you know, there's growing rumors of insurrection, growing rumors of rebellion. So let me just wrap up by showing you these results. So these are letter level regressions where each letter is matched to the place that it is describing. And we organize these places based on the change in crown revenue during the reform period. So take this with a grain of salt because this is purely correlational cross-sectional. But what the correlation suggests is that the places where the crown raised more revenue during the reform period are places where these correspondence is more likely to be talking about insurrection, secession, independence, that type of thing. These letters, by the way, and I'll, I'll wrap up after this, correspond to this critical period, 1807, 1811, when the King of Spain abdicates and kind of the, the whole system collapses. So to wrap up, we study what I think is one of the most ambitious administrative reforms in the colonial world. And we show that this reform that involves both changes in personnel and in territorial government does lead to improvements in fiscal capacity and does raise more revenue. The interesting question is at what cost? And our suggestive evidence points to growing Creole antipathy towards the crown and you know, a potential driver for the independence movement that would unfold uh, shortly afterwards. Thank you. Sorry about the extra no minute. Clement, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, it's really great paper and data, Luis. Um, I was wondering, so when we think about investing in state capacity, we think about the long, long run consequences on like, you know, being able to do more public good delivery, et cetera. Um, but here you show it as a very negative thing, just short, short term extractive institution. Do you have anything to suggest that there are long term positive impacts, maybe looking at what expenditure increased after the intendants came? Because you said you have breakdown of the different lines of expenditures, right? Yes, that is, that is a terrific question, Clement. I'll say two things on that. The first one is, uh, we do know, we do have, we do have data on expenditure. We are actually in an ongoing process of reclassifying that a bit more thinly. But one thing that I can tell you is this state is not your modern state that provides public goods. You know, as mm. some of the papers that we have been describing, this is not a state that provides education, health, stuff like that. In our ongoing effort, we have tried to single out any line items that have a public goods flavor to them roads, for instance, right. and what we find is a negligible impact on that. You know, what the historians suggest is all of this goes to building ships in Havana to fight the British, you know, forts, soldiers, uh, that type of thing. To answer your the second part of your question, this would be here, is we have put together, I didn't even mention this, a present day data set of municipal public finance for the continent. Now, of course, take that with a grain of salt mm. because different taxes in different countries mean different things. But if anything, our correlation suggests, again, that the places that did better during the reform where revenue increased by a larger amount, they actually collect lower taxes today. Uh, so, you know, if anything, there seems to be kind of a fiscal reversal of fortune mm. going on. Thanks. Stephen? Yeah, thank you. So very impressive piece of work, and the amount of data you've collected is uh, is enormous. But um, uh, I still have I still wonder if you've also been able to look at missionaries. And um, the reason I'm saying this is because the effect of names, uh, you know, the names, people naming their children after the ruler declined steeply and sharply. Uh, is that really grievances, or is that also correlated maybe with the expansion of missionaries who may have started to Christian um, indigenous names 
and um, and perhaps that also led to more literacy leading to those letters uh, asking for independence. Um, so uh, that's I, that's a that's a great question. Actually, let me return to the names for a second. Uh, so one thing that your question made me think about is a bit before our reform, uh, the king, there's the expulsion of the Jesuits, which you know my co-author Felipe Valencia has has studied uh, before. So you know I'm wondering whether that could be uh, a way in which kind of the role of of the religious communities uh, affects this. It is true, you know, the king did want the intendants to be perceived as the representative of the crown at this provincial level. And so a way to kind of enhance, you know, their, their stature was they had uh, they had power over clerical appointments. So, I mean, maybe, you know, let me just say, I don't have a great answer for your question, but you're making me think about lots of things that we can, that we can certainly explore. Thank you. Great. Let me ask also a quick uh, question. So uh, first, uh, there are not all that many intendencias, right? So I mean, I think that it's very reassuring that you can include this uh, region fixed effects, but I don't know if you can do something more in terms of like showing correlates with the timing uh, based on changes or based on characteristics of the, of the regions. Um, and the second question is that in terms of your narrative, um, it seems that these corregidores were not doing great either, no? They were very oppressive of the local population, but then you see that the intendant has even in far, further increased this content. So it would be great to try to get measures of this content of opposition that differentiate between the Creole elite and the local population, no? For the, for the narrative to square, because we would expect that the local population might be happier with these intendencias than with the corregidores. Yes, I think you're, you know, you're the second part of your question, you, you get the, you get our narrative right about in the previous system, the elite seem to be extracting rents of some sort, the, the indigenous population is oppressed, and now there seems to be kind of this, this reversal of, of fortune uh, for these two groups, which is precisely what we have tried to document through the indigenous rebellions vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the other measures of like, uh, Creole, antipathy. Uh, I mean, as you can imagine, data availability has been a, has been a challenge. Uh, but you know what what you're saying is is what the historians suggest. Regarding the, the the first part of your question, you're right that you know the intendencias, I believe in total, there's like 60 or 80 of them. There's not a lot. We do uh, what you're suggesting, which is, you know, does the timing of the arrival of the intendants correlate with some uh, observable characteristics? Uh, we don't see a lot there. And as I mentioned earlier, something that I find reassuring is uh, the fact that the effect seems to be driven by when the intendencia de facto begins to operate, when the intendant actually arrives, rather than you know, by when the announcement is made. In fact, we have some additional results that I didn't even mention where since we know these intendants when they are working where, we can look at kind of returns to experience. And we do find that, you know, it is only after two, three years that the intendant starts to do a good job. And when an intendant leaves and the other one hasn't arrived in that interregnum, like stuff doesn't work as, as well as before. Okay, thanks. Last question from Mateo. Keep in mind that we are in the break time and we have very long, very short breaks. Yeah, very, very briefly. Uh, thanks a lot, Luis. I, I was just curious about the, the insurrection measures. So I'm curious about why you only focus on indigenous insurrections, uh, if you have anything on other types of insurrections, and also of the, about the nature of the insurrections. Why do you know why they are insurrecting? If you could do a separate analysis for different types of things, maybe that would be interesting to shed light on the mechanisms. Uh, thank you, Mateo. So we focus on the indigenous rebellions because there is some good data on that. We have been, again, we're so interested in understanding the connection between this and you know, the growing independence movement, which is mostly a Creole rather than an indigenous uh, movement. But the data there just doesn't exist. I've looked, we've looked everywhere for, you know, is there a data set of like independence battles or like maps that show you, okay, this part of the continent is under crown control. This is where Simon Bolivar is or something. And, you know, 
there's just it's just not there. That's why you know the letters that we were able to code, we thought, okay, this 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 seems promising, and certainly uh, we do know some things about the nature of the indigenous rebellions. Does this have to do with you know with famine, with taxation, with you know uh, some other type? We could explore that heterogeneity. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Okay, great, Luis. Thank you so much. Very impressive paper. So let's take a, a seven minutes break uh, and let's be back in shortly. Thank you, everyone. And sorry for the short breaks. Yeah. Luis, can you can you look at it as an alternative? Can we keep using this space? <laughs> what? Can, can you do you have data on, on the participation of local elites in the independence army? So how, how many of the like top generals um, of the independence army are are locals? Um, because it's, I mean, or, or I'm not sure if even if top generals or, or in general, uh, just soldiers or, or, yeah, what, or whatever, I, right? I mean, because yeah, that, that, that's that's kind of a revealed preference measure of if I send my kid to to war, I really care about it. <laughs> I mean, like these papers on World War One or World War Two, where you yep. know, like within France, the soldiers come from here or there. Ah. Uh, but I mean, I'm not sure if there's a list of. <laughs> I mean, I think, but it, but it it's hard to make it comprehensive. I think I've seen, <clears throat> say, for a place like Peru, you can find some book that will be like you know, biographical dictionary of prestigious of noblemen of Lima, and you know, and there's the Leones and the Siliotas, mm -hmm. I'm sure, in there. Uh, <laughs> and and you mm -hmm. know, so. No, but 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 from, from I mean, if there is a list of the of the army, you can you can tell by the names. Although the crows has have very Spanish names, no. Because, because I think I found like you know I've I've tried looking for this like you know mm. independence heroes or independence, but then the question right. is how do you build the denominator? So you know, suppose that I tell you uh, out of I Simon see. Bolivar's. 50 top generals, they came from here, here, and here. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, like you would want to have like something interesting that I thought of, but that data doesn't exist is, you know, the Universidad de San Marcos goes all the way back to, is mm -hmm. it San Marcos, I think? Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it, it would be a massive data collection effort to go and yeah. look at, okay, this gives you a sense of who the elites are. And then can you trace these people and say, you know, are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The name things is very cool. <laughs> the... No, and the the I like the maps. I wish I had more time to talk about the the maps. <laughs> Where are they? You know, we've been we've yeah. been drawing we've been drawing these maps where you have like the grid of the continent, mm -hmm. and we can show you at different points in time, like literally what places do you know something about versus which places you you don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is super interesting. You told it that. Yes. Wait, the, 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 there was a map of, of the what is it? Is that Pascuano? I guess so. Yeah, huh. the, this looks like it, right? Super cool. Yeah, but but unfortunately, you know, we know a lot about like this period, 1780s, 1790s, but then you turn the page to the 1800s and it just, you know, on the fiscal side, these treasuries start to disappear. Mm. So it's hard to do like, okay, long run fiscal impact is, is right. and of course, once these countries become independent, it's like a black hole, you know, there's- yeah. All right, gonna run to the bathroom very quickly. All right, thank you. <laughs> See you in a bit. Yeah, so thank you very much for the uh, opportunity, and uh, and thank you everyone for tuning in as we're getting closer to the weekend. 
Um, so this paper is about uh, we're moving to Africa as a part of the world, and this paper is about roads, and it's a joint work with Roberto Bonfatti, who's in Padova, and Yuan Gu, who's now in the uh, private sector. So um, let me start with a very broad sort of motivation of why we're interested in looking at roads and in Africa in particular. So, so starting from a very broad perspective, we subscribe to the institutional view of development that uh, that we would need inclusive political institutions to uh, to generate sustained economic growth, and that at least nowadays um, institutions are probably more important than geography, which may have played a larger role um, in the more distant past. And um, the, the broad idea of this view is, of course, that you need inclusive political institutions to deliver what's needed for growth, such as public goods and uh, everything else that uh, supports a uh, market economy and and uh, creates incentives for people to, um, to to prosper. So in this paper, we're focusing on just one particular type of such market supporting policies, which is the paving of roads. So the paper is not so much about um, about how many roads are built. But it's more about improving roads and it's about where they are built as opposed to how many. So we're going to look at the shape of the network of, uh, of roads as it develops over time in, uh, in, in Africa and in West Africa in, uh, in particular. Now, part of the motivation is also that the if you just look at the map of Africa, and I'll show you a map uh, in a few slides, is that um, the, sh the shape it looks like it's very interior to coast. And what I mean by that is that most of the roads or the paved roads, so the ones that are all weather and can be used uh, uh, throughout the year, they tend to connect the interior of countries to the coast in almost straight lines. And there are very few connections between countries. Um, and, and there's an, a notion here that that may be suboptimal um, because you know many of those have been built or are, are still maintained for the purpose of exporting natural resources, which started in colonial times, but uh, has been you know, continued in, in recent decades as well. Because you need roads and railways to export, you know, uh, copper, iron, ore, and gold from from wherever the mine is to a port to export it to the rest of the world. So this interior to coast type of network may have persisted over time from colonial times, um, leading to a fragmented regional trade patterns and maybe also poor economic performance, or at least may have contributed to this. So you know, th this this notion is is popular in the sense that if you look at the um, um, the, the main projects that uh, institutions like the African Development Bank, the World Bank, the G20, but also China's Belt and Road Initiative, for example, the uh, policies they follow and is that high on the agenda is in improvements in infrastructure, or at least investment in infrastructure to try to uh, to, to build a more a, a network that also connects um, you know other parts of the country, but also countries to each other. So here's a map of uh, of Africa. And this also shows you some of the data that we'll be using, which is a um, uh, digitized version of, of roadmaps. And here uh, we're looking at 1965. And the region we're focusing on is West Africa. Main reason is that it's um, a sort of a massive co data collection effort to try to digitize these uh, these old maps. And and we're interested in the actual network. So we haven't digitized it as a grid where you you know you have little squares and you have a dummy whether there is a road or not. But we want to be able to to kind of reproduce Google Maps, but then back in time. So that you can find, you can follow the shortest route from one point to another and see exactly what the shape of the network is. Um, so, but for West Africa here, what we're showing is uh, in green, sort of all roads that existed uh, ever in time uh, between 65 and even today, but including like dirt tracks, but uh, the solid black lines are the paved roads as of 1965. And what this is meant to show is that indeed there is this sort of interior to coast kind of pattern of, of road uh, improvements. There are very few connections uh, between countries. Most of it is from the interior of a country to, to the coast in a straight line. But this is all just very, very suggestive. Um, now, moving forward to 2014, which is the last uh, series of maps that we've digitized, uh, the pattern has changed. There's massive improvement in 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 roads. Um, paved roads have expanded, but still, of, overall, it's you know it's still kind of interior to coast. So not that many connections between countries. And a country like Liberia, for example, has still you know very few paved roads. But there is improvement, but still nothing like the amount of roads you would see in Europe, for example. Of course. Now, to to continue my motivation um, is to say that. Um, well, this pattern of interior to coast infrastructure is not necessarily suboptimal, right? We're not going to claim that at all because 
you might say, well, you know, if your comparative advantage is indeed natural resources, then the type of infrastructure you need to export those is interior to coast. So this might just be a response to comparative advantage and not at all suboptimal. Now, we did find in the earlier work that we did together is that uh, such infrastructure does lead to less trade between countries. And if you believe that trade is important for regional development, then you know it is a limit on that regional development because you, if you build this type of roads, you're not lowering your trade costs with neighbors, for example. So there's a missed opportunity there of, of trade. Um, but it does lead to the question, what, what should governments do or what should they have done over this period? You know, and governments have changed over time and we're going to look at that as well. Um, but what should the governments have done ideally? Should they connect large cities or, or should they connect deep ports or just connect large deposits if that's comparative advantage? Um, and so we're going to look over time, what, what did governments do and what, what type of decisions did they make and does it resemble a particular, particular network? More uh, closer to what we do, we look at democracy and we ask whether there's uh, elite capture and ethnic favoritism, uh, uh, if there's a role for those, those um, mechanisms here too, when we look at road construction. So in this paper, we're going to ask, were the interior to cost roads disproportionately put in place by autocracies? So did autocratic governments make very different decisions from democracies? If we find that, and I'm going to try to convince you that we do, is then that is sort of prima facie evidence that it might be suboptimal. If you believe, you know, assuming that uh, autocracies do not uh, have in mind uh, what's best for the country, but probably have in mind what's best for themselves or for the ruling elite that they, they represent. So assuming that extractive political institutions relative to the inclusive ones put more weight on the gains of a narrow elite, so rent seeking, than on general welfare. And now one sure way to extract rents is to indeed focus on natural resources and extract them and export them to world markets and you know, capture the benefits of those. So, but to be able to do so, you do need infrastructure to connect those deposits to ports. So if we find that autocracies tend to favor those type of connections over anything else, then that's suggestive at least that they were not, that is not optimal what they were doing, that they were doing that to enrich themselves. Um, and of course, we have to exclude any other, uh, other explanation that might drive these, uh, these patterns. So our approach is to focus on historical road paving and changes of, uh, of government over time. So when countries move from auto autocracy to democracy and, and vice versa. And we're going to follow a method uh, very much inspired by Burgess and others uh, from an AR 2015 paper where they looked at Kenya and where they compared actual road improvements over time to a counterfactual, a counterfactual of you know, what could they have done alternatively. So we're going to follow that uh, their work, but then do this for, for West Africa. And also look not just at cities, but at minerals, at uh, deposits. Um, now, comparing actual paving to this counterfactual, we're going to correlate that with measures of autocracy at the beginning of a period. And uh, you know, just to shed light on our main results already now is that we fi do find that autocratic governments were significantly more likely to connect deposits to ports than democratic governments were. But we also find that, so, so we call this a bias, a bias uh, for focusing on these deposit to port connections rather than anything else. And, but we also find that this bias is really only present for deposits, so mineral deposits that are discovered on, uh, uh, on, on, the, eth on the elite's ethnic homelands. Um, so, so, you know, there's many ethnicities in Africa and, and some of them are in a particular period in time in power and others are not. Now, if they are in power, then the elite is also connecting uh, deposits that are found on their own ethnic homeland in favor of, uh, of other deposits. And that's again suggestive of rent seeking as a potential mechanism here of why the network is shaped in this particular way. And in terms of the size of the effect, well, we do find that, that sort of a one standard deviation increase in autocracy increases overlap with this uh, deposit to port counterfactual that we'll construct later with about half standard deviation. So it's not a small effect. Um, now to just uh, mention a few papers that are related uh, to to what we do, and, you know, there are many more, but these these are our main um, uh, our main inspiration. This of course worked by Dave Donaldson on uh, market integration, how it leads to price convergence, and um, how uh, road construction helps therein. But also the effects of road construction on local growth. So worked by Benergy and StoryGuard, of course. And the work by Asimoglu, um, you know, the famous paper that uh, democracy causes growth. Um, 
um, where you know the claim is that democracies do the right thing, whatever the right thing is for growth. And in this paper, we're focusing on road construction and the shape of the network as one potential way of how democracies may 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 make better decisions. Now, the Burgess paper also found that there's ethnic favoritism in road construction in in Kenya. Um, and there's also work by Elder and Kondo, for example, on the Chinese motorway expansion, um, which both show that elites uh, tend to favor um, policies, uh, tend to create policies in their favor, and paper uh, follows in this in this tradition. Now, I should also mention uh, Feigelbaum and Schaal's uh, work uh, on the uh, uh, getting closer to a welfare measure of the what the optimal road network should look like, and the quantitative spatial models that have been developed uh, as a result. Now, our paper doesn't develop such a model because we, we feel that um, that's a bigger challenge because you would need a lot of information on these African countries going back in time, including like subnational uh, trade patterns, for example, to say which road network would have been optimal going back in time. So we are saying that you know, as a country goes to, towards autocracy, they make decisions that are more closely uh, resemble um, uh, rent seeking as opposed to anything else. But we don't make a firm stand on how far or close that brings us from the optimal optimal network. So our empirical strategy is to uh, relate variation in autocratic versus democratic rule to subsequent road investment. And our main dependent uh, variable is deposit to port bias, which I'll define more um, precisely in a moment, um, which we then regress on autocracy, control variables, uh, country and uh, time fixed effects and country specific trends. And this deposit to port bias is a measure that, that, that we construct, which is uh, the extent to which the road paving we observe in any point in time and any place. Uh, so imagine 100 kilometers of roads are newly paved in a particular year. To what extent does this overlap with an alternative uh, network, an, an alternative policy where you would only pave roads that connect uh, mineral deposits to ports? And the closer, the closer it resembles that network, the more higher the overlap. Um, the more, you know, our interpretation is that autocracies are, are after rent seeking rather than building uh, the, the best network uh, that the country would otherwise need. So uh, just briefly our data, autocracy is the polity IV uh, uh, measure. Um, alternatively, we can also use Asimoglu's uh, uh, else, uh, dummy where you just have zero one versus, uh, where, you know, dummy equals to one when you're autocratic, but we are using the variation uh, between those two extremes as well. Ethnicity here is uh, Murdoch's map, uh, but also the ethnic power relationship core data set. Um, so we're not after just the ethnicity of the president uh, or dictator, um, but we have a measure here of for every ethnicity, to what extent are they uh, sharing in, in power? Are they dominant or uh, major or maybe minor partners in, 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 in power at that moment in time? So it's slightly broader definition than just a ruler. And we track whether a mineral deposit lies on you know that that ethnicity's uh, homeland. Uh, minerals themselves come from a consultancy firm called Minex, which uh, uh, also gives us the date of discovery of all these uh, these minerals, which we use over time as well. And then uh, we have some other control variables uh, like foreign aid, FDI, and, and and civil war. So this is our set of countries, and here you see how uh, governments evolved over time, and most of them were autocratic at the start. So we've sort of inversed your usual definition of the polity IV measure. So 10 here means uh, autocratic. Um, and over time, you see sort of a tendency towards dem democratization. And if you look at the solid line here, that's the Asimoglu dummy. And uh, <clears throat> that also switches towards democracy over time for, for most countries. But we do feel that uh, if you look at Guinea, for example, that you know, this variation here, um, when you know they're not democratic yet, but they're going towards democracy is useful variation to use. So but, you know all our results are robust to using either either measure. Um, now the road network. Uh, so we're looking at paved roads because these are all weather roads, and uh, on average about 125 kilometers are paved in a given year. But there's a large standard deviation. We could also look at improved roads, partially improved roads, earth roads, or tracks, but none of those are all weather roads. And we feel that you know paved roads are most important for for trade, for example, because you can use them year round. And you know for exporting minerals, you need you know good roads because you know for heavy trucks and such. Now the maps come from from Michelin. We're not the first ones to digitize these, um, but I think we are the first ones to digitize them to sort of a a high quality where you can do routing, where you can kind of resemble Google Maps, but then going back in time. So instead of a grid where you have a dummy, 
we, you know, we have the actual network because you know, if you just have grids, you, you may miss that there's a river in between and there is no bridge, for example. But you know, if you if you improve the quality there, you you get slightly more precision. Um, and we also increased the, the resolution by starting off with a digital um, map uh, from 2015 and going back in time, which is almost like you know deleting roads that were not there yet in earlier years. So here's road construction for all these countries, um, <clears throat> and there's, um, you know, there's a lot of variation. This is scaled by the size of the country. So of course, you know, some large countries uh, probably pave more, uh, but there's there's big differences over time. Um, overall, there's an improvement over time. You you do see road density going down somewhat. That's because roads can also deteriorate. So they may be destroyed in wars, for example, or they're just not maintained. And after a while, they're, they're not considered paved anymore, or not, not considered all weather roads anymore. And we, we also check that into account. Um, so here's an example of country. This is Sierra Leone. And um, the two colors here are the network in two points in time. Black is the paved network in 1965, and red is the network in 2014. And as you can see that even by 2014, there, there's still cities, these blue dots, cities and towns that are not connected by paved roads. Um, now these green stars here, those are deposits. And uh, well, it could be that this road is built here for those deposits, could also be built to connect that, that city, but that's kind of the difference between those two um, incentives is, is what we're after. Um, now the challenge of constructing our dependent variable is that we know which roads were paved in country I and PRT, but how to estimate uh, the bias uh, towards uh, an alternative counterfactual. So, so to create a counterfactual of what, co what governments could have done instead, instead of what we actually observe, is to make a, a, a ranking. So we, we rank locations, um, locations that you might want to connect in a country, and then sort of move down the ranking and start paving the, the highest priority um, pair of, of locations and move down the ranking like that. So the highest priority pair of locations in the counterfactual is, let's say, a large mine or a very valuable mine and a large port. Now, if later in time that connection has already been made and then another discovery is made, another mine is deposit discovered somewhere, then, then that will move up the ranking, right? Then that, that's probably the next connection you want to make. Uh, and so we have variation over time in the deposits that are being discovered, which kind of shakes up this ranking and shakes up what the counterfactual uh, network should look like. And then we're going to compare that to the actual paving we observe and say, well, you know, if they actually paved 100 kilometers, but it, you know, how much of that overlaps with this counterfactual network? So that's going to be a measure between zero and one. Possibly all of it overlaps, possibly nothing. Um, yeah, so this is a little bit, uh, I'm probably going too slow in terms of time, but um, so the measure is like market potential. You kind of add up the size of the port where we have an index in terms of the depth of the port. So how big uh, how big of ships can it accommodate and a measure of the uh, the value of deposits, um, which we put into four quartiles and then divided by the distance between them, right? So you may also want to start connecting things that are close together. So that, that's also taken into account. Uh, so to go back to my example country of Sierra Leone, um, now the, the black is still the network in 1965 and the red network here on the left panel is the actual network in 1986. So between 65 and 86, the red parts of um, road were paved. Right? So that, that's the expansion of the network between those points in time. Now, so, so that's what actually happened. We, we could also say, well, given that they had a particular, we observed this particular budget in paving, we observe how much paving happened and that's our budget. What if we reassign it to this alternative network where you only focus on the connecting deposits to, to, to the largest ports? Well, then the network would have looked like this over time. And as you can see, you know, now it's all those, those uh, locations of deposits that have a paved road connection to the, to the main port. Um, so now, Looking at the uh, additions uh, from, that were made uh, close to 1986, those are encircled here on the left-hand side map. So those were recently paved. So compared to the 1984 map. So those are the additions. And then we say, well, what, how, how much of those additions actually overlap with this alternative counterfactual? And then it's really only here along the coast that there's a little bit of overlap. So our measure of our dependent variable is, is 9% here because only 9% of all paved kilometers overlap with this alternative network. And then our question is, uh, so that's a kind of a low degree of overlap. So our question then is, 
who was in charge in 1984 and 1986? And was it a democratic or an autocratic government that decided to pave roads uh, in these circled locations as opposed to uh, the locations you would need to connect, you know, for example, these deposits to a port with a, with a paved road? Um, in the interest of time, let me, um, oh, well, no, I should talk about this, I think, because this is the descriptive statistics of how much paving happens in all these countries. So on average, 100 something kilometers, maybe 300 kilometers in the case of Mali, for example. But there's also deterioration because of lack of maintenance or maybe war or natural disasters where some paved roads are no longer paved. Now, here's our main dependent variable that is deposit to port bias. And you can see in so this column here, um, you see my, my, my mouse there. Um, that's our sort of our baseline measure of, uh, of bias. And you can see there's variation across countries also that it's kind of high in, in Ghana and Benin, and it was kind of low in, in Jair and Togo, for example. Um, now we can construct it in different ways. For example, we could also include diamond mines, although we think, well, diamonds are such high value that they would be uh, airlifted rather than uh, needing paved roads. Um, we could also include into, I mean, take into account all the deterioration and say, well, <clears throat> uh, how, how to do this? Because that means that the road was paved, is no longer paved, and then you have to repave it. Is that as costly as uh, building a new road? Well, maybe it is and maybe it isn't. So you would just sort of vary the cost of repaving a previously paved road. Uh, we could also say that, well, you know, the main ports are probably also capital cities or uh, large cities, which is very often the case. Let's let's give them double weights just because of that. Or maybe we should look at railways as well. Uh, although railways tend to be in a very poor state, um, have not been maintained over over all these decades, and the few that are operational tend to be you know run by mining companies themselves. But because of that fact, we should take them into account and say, well, let's exclude deposits that are very close to railways. Um, and then focus only on the deposits that, uh, that don't have a real and rely on roads. Um, so that's you know, all these different measures of our dependent variable. So then to get to our results, um, here's sort of the baseline measure where I'm you know, just using roads and uh, not including diamond mines, et cetera. And we're regressing it on, on autocracy. And the, the first finding here is that indeed in periods of autocracy, we do find that the roads that are being paved more resemble this deposit to port network, this alternative counterfactual network. So that at first sort of shows that autocracies take different decisions from democracies, right? So they tend to build uh, roads that, that do connect these uh, these mines to, to ports as opposed to, to building them anywhere else. Now, there's a couple of th things too important to control for because, well, you know, if the, the, degree, the degree of overlap was already very high because the, you know, all the mines have already been connected, for example, then mechanically you might uh, you might get a, a positive effect of, of, of autocracy. And so controlling for that, um, uh, you know, our main effect is, is still there, although you do, do have this negative coefficient there. It doesn't change our, our main effect. And then we want to control for things like uh, sort of time varying controls for comparative advantage. So the cumulative number of discoveries you've made so far, uh, the number of discoveries you've made in the most recent year, but also a price index of the value of those discoveries. Because uh, you know, if, if whatever deposits you have are now very valuable because world prices have changed, then maybe you have more more uh, funding available for road construction and the, those kinds of effects. And and that may also correlate with uh, how how strong um, how persistent the autocracy is that is currently in power. But none of that really changes our main effect. Then in the fourth column, we want to explicitly control for uh, the degree to which the uh, deposits that are discovered are on these ethnic homelands of the ruling elite. So, so this measures the ethnic deposits here, or lack of a better label perhaps, is the, the share of the deposits that have been discovered that still need to be connected to paved road, but that are on the ethnic homeland of the current ruling elite. And it does suggest that that's, that's an important control because you know, the more deposits are on those ethnic homelands, uh, the more likely it is that um, the roads that are being built indeed try to connect those mines to, to a port. So that's what we're controlling here for. But still, the effect of autocracy is, is significant there. Now, a favorite explanation of why autocracy choose to, to pave these roads that connect mines to ports is to say that that's rent-seeking or, 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 or getting closer to, to what you might call suboptimal. And our favorite interpretation is supported by this positive interaction here, interaction between autocracy and the degree to the share of deposits that is on these ethnic homelands 
um, the ethnic homeland of the current ruler, which in this case, you know, if this turns on one, is the autocratic ruler. And then we find this positive interaction and I'm looking, you know, across the distribution of of um, um, of ethnicity, we do find that for the median and for the mean and also the 75th percentile, we find then this very positive effect that autocracies do tend to favor these uh, these roads that connect mines to uh, to ports. But it's not there for uh, when these deposits are not at all at ethnic homelands. So so that sort of supports our favorite interpretation here that that it's um, rent seeking and uh, ethnic favoritism that is behind this uh, effect of autocracy on the on the shape of uh, of the network favoring uh, connecting minds to ports. Um, now, despite our uh, our control variables, uh, we also follow Asimoglu in instrumenting for autocracy and just take the, the, the same strategy here of instrumenting um, autocracy with a, a lagged regional average of autocracy of other countries in the region. Now, we have a, you know, a much smaller sample than uh, Asimoglu had in his paper. So um, to include the neighboring countries of West Africa in this, this measure, what we do have to say here that most of the variation is is over time rather than uh, in the cross section because we just have one region to look at right so we don't have, have cross sectional variation there that we can use so so to try to exploit more of the time variation in column 2 we drop the year fixed effects but replace them by five year period fixed effects and that allows some variation there within the five year period for autocracy to change in neighboring countries which then predicts also uh, um institutional change in the uh, the country that we're looking at. So just looking at the statistics that that works, it, it does predict autocracy, you know, it's highly significant and also the F-test is, uh, is high enough. And then we do find that um, uh, still to the effect of autocracy and deposit to port bias is, uh, is sizable. And the size of the effect increases between the OLS and the IV version, but that also happens in uh, sort of uh, our next slide where we control for some other alternative um, mechanisms. So the more we control for kind of the larger the effect is that we find of autocracy on the, on the where on where these governments build roads. So other mechanisms are, you know, maybe autocracies pave more to begin with. Um, we don't find that that's the case in a simple regression, but also controlling here for the current amount of paving that takes place, you know, our main um, coefficient of interest uh, does not change. May also be that autocracies are more open to trade. Um, you know, maybe they are more interested per se in uh, in exporting minerals, for example, or otherwise being open. I don't think they are, uh, but that also doesn't change our main effect. And then maybe for indirect investment, and aid is important to control for because aid agencies, but also um, let's say mining companies that invest in a country, may themselves build roads and have a very different agenda from from the government. So that, that may also be important to control for. But again, that doesn't change our our main effect. Control for civil wars, and then. Lastly, here we control for a measure of city overlap, and that is because you might say, well, those deposits, um, you know, maybe they just happen to be next to big cities. So maybe the roads that they are building is not so much connecting these deposits to ports, but just connecting big cities, and the deposits happen to be close to those big cities. So we try to control for that here by making a similar overlap measure, but where the counterfactual network is not um, connecting deposits to ports, but it's connecting big cities first, big cities that are close together. So same measure as uh, Burgess and Adele were using in their Kenya paper. And controlling for that, um, it, it is a significant variable, but again, our main coefficient of interest does not change. And then including everything there, um, the size of our main coefficient is still is, is bigger. Now, uh, one of my last slides is robustness here, uh, where we vary our measure of uh, deposit to port bias as taking into account diamonds, uh, deterioration, giving main ports double weight, excluding deposits near railways. Or maybe just making our ranking uh, not based on this version of market potential where you take the product of the size of the port and the size of the deposit and divide it by distance, but use, for example, distance only, or use um, the value of deposits only. And uh, wh whatever we do, our, our main coefficient of interest is still there and significant. Finally, we can treat standard errors differently. We can um, uh, we can cluster them by country, although we don't have so many so many uh, countries to cluster on. So um, we can do by country and year, or we just uh, see what the wild bootstrap gives us. Uh, and the wild bootstrap is also almost always uh, significant there. So just to conclude, I'm thinking one minute over time. Um, so we track road paving and measure overlap with the deposit to port counterfactual in West Africa. And we find that autocracies take very different decisions from democracies. They pave roads. It's not about how many roads they pave, but they pave them in different locations. 
they create a different network than democracies do. And the network that autocracies create resembles more what you would need to, uh, if you would only focus on the on, on, on connecting the buses to ports. And we feel that this is important. Um, well, for one, countries have become more democratic, but democracies are under pressure. They might become autocratic again. But if they autocratic regimes build roads in different places, then that has long run effects as well. We don't show the long run effects here, but arguably roads are durable and and you know that that may create development issues uh, further down the road. Um, we also find that it's very much driven by deposits that are located on the current government's ethnic homeland. So ethnic favoritism plays a role here, but we feel our, that, that it's also supportive of our favorite interpretation that it's about rent seeking of these uh, autocratic governments, as opposed to you know, an alternative interpretation that alternative, alternatively autocracies may be just better than democracies in exploiting comparative advantage. But we don't think that's the case because then you would not see this, this, this ethnic dimension per se. So I'll stop here and thank you. Okay, so yeah, so let me uh, start the conversation. I have a uh, uh, couple of questions. Um, let me put it this way. Uh, I, I, ha I mean, I, I find the focus on ports and mine to be highly problematic. For two reasons, uh, historical reasons. Uh, early 20th century, when uh, uh, you know those colonies were put in place, one of the key motivation was territorial control. So roads were built to connect cities, pre-colonial cities, as opposed to mines, because I mean those mines did not even exist, or nobody knew they existed. You know, and the second one is um, the focus on mines as opposed to cash crop and agricultural markets. Because, you know, if you, you mentioned Benin, uh, diamond maybe account for less than 1% of Benin exports, if at all, most of the exports in Benin was, uh, is cotton, you know? And, um, and, and yeah, anyway, so but, but, uh, uh, the third point is about, uh, you know, I, I think we have a standard, you know, the model that uh, um, uh, Robin and Coulters put in place, looking at regime type variation within country, within ethnic group, for instance, and looking at domestic markets as to find optimal road networks. You know, I think that model seems to be more convincing in a sense like hard to compare regime type across countries, you know? So anyway, so those are the three points. Maybe uh, I, I will let you maybe uh, respond and maybe later on uh, bilaterally, we can uh, have uh, a serious conversation about um, about the funding. Thank you. All right, yeah, well, thank you for thank you for the questions. Um, no, you're right that uh, the, most of the, um, uh, you know, if you look at the 1965 network, then a lot of that uh, was put in place by colonial powers because from 65, uh, independence started to happen. But, but we kind of take the 1965 network as given at that moment in time and look at how it changes afterwards. And so, so, so we're not so much after as explaining the network as a whole, but, but how, it, how it's shaped after 1965, you know, what parts of the network are maintained and where is it expanded? So, you know, so we're looking at the post-colonial period and how it expanded during that period. And, did different governments build roads in, in different places? And that that's what we're after, rather than explaining uh, where they, how it started in 1965. Sorry, but you, of course, the, the you're, point, you're, sorry. The point is, please respond to this. So, the focus on economic motives, as opposed to political motive for road construction. You, you see what I mean? So that's where the problem for me really is, the fact that roads are built for mines and ports, not for anything else or almost nothing else. That's what the fundamental problem is. Can you address that? Well, we're not saying that they're built only for, for ports and mines, but we, so we observe an actual network that's, that's built for, for many different reasons, like a, a weighted average of all the different reasons you might build a road, I suppose. Um, but we want to compare that to some hypothetical counterfactual. And that is very hypothetical, right? It's very extreme. What if you would only, indeed only focus on those deposits and ports? So all we're saying is to what extent does the actual paving kind of overlap with this, that extreme alternative? 
but we're not saying that there aren't any other alternatives. There are many other alternatives. Um, but this the, and our our claim is that in the deport deposit uh, in the uh, deposit to port counterfactual is the one you would need if you want to maximize uh, rent seeking from natural resources. But of course, you're right to say that while rent seeking, you, you, you could also do it with cash crops and cash crops is indeed something we're missing. But but we don't see a very um, straightforward way to say what what counterfactual net, what does, what does the counterfactual network look like if you only focus on cash crops, for example? Or if you want to include mines and cash crops together, how do you how do you weigh them in our ranking? You know, how do you how do you rank those? Because they're they're hard to compare. Plus, with cash crops, uh, they're they're not in one point. Whereas a deposit is in one point in, on the map, whereas cash crops cover an area. So, so where should you build the road then if you want to you know uh, connect that area of agricultural uh, cash crops? So so that wasn't straight. So yeah, we don't see kind of the best way to to do cash crops in in that sense. And and diamonds, we we don't include diamonds in our main specification. So yeah. Sorry, uh, other questions? Who else want to jump in? There was one question in the chat. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, you see it? Can I, can I ask one? Yeah, yeah. please. So, Stephen, maybe I missed this towards the end, but you know, I, I find your results to be very thought provoking. Is it possible to go one step further and kind of do some back of the envelope calculation about, you know, the like the efficiency implications of the spatial misallocation in infrastructure associated with political regimes or something like that? Like, because you know, you're able to tell us, okay, in this regime, things seem to be better placed than in this other, but I was left wondering, like, how big of a deal is this, say, in terms of, yeah, in terms of money or in terms of of some relevant metric? Yeah, that's that's a good point, and that's not um, that's not so easy to do. I mean, ideally, you would say, well, this harms welfare with a with a certain certain amount, but um, I think for that you do need like a quantitative spatial model, but then ideally also one that has time variation to to cover this period. And um, yeah, I think that that's that's really for future work. Um, yeah, so this is one step in that direction, but there's there is certainly more work to do to say you know what's the what's the main uh, size of the effect uh, in terms of welfare. So on average, we say you know if a country becomes autocratic, you would find that now suddenly half of the road construction tends to favor these deposits to ports uh, connections as opposed to anything else, and uh, you might say. Think that well probably it should be closer to anything else if you want to include other motivations to build roads like indeed connecting cash crops for example or cities steven um i have a question related to the counterfactuals that you are constructing uh, and in particular i'm, I'm interested in, in, in knowing uh, why why are you using uh, the discovery and the ranking uh, to get at, at those counterfactuals uh, for me it's it's a bit like the, the main construction is a bit endogenous, right? So you, you discover certain mines precisely because you have access to the roads that are reached to certain places to begin with, uh, or some efforts could be given to their conservation. So I was, I was thinking on like what would be a good counterfactual in this scenario and looking at other papers that looked at, at this road construction would be interesting to see if you can basically just simulate potential uh, uh, network structures. Um, and showing how the effect uh, compares to the simulated network that you might construct. So you compare the distribution of potential roads that democratic regimes could do compared to the autocratic ones and see if there are actually a difference between the distribution of those. Yeah. Um, something of, of that sort. Um, that's, yeah. yeah, that's something, something we can look at. So we, we use indeed the discovery of deposits and, and basically we're assuming that the moment of discovery is exogenous there. So it gives us some time variation of it shakes up that ranking of, over time. But um, um, yeah, so one way we try to address that maybe deposits are discovered closer to um, to places that are better connected. So maybe larger cities, so we do control for that. Uh, but we could look closer indeed at whether there's systematic um, uh, systematically deposits are discovered close to existing roads. Yeah, we haven't done that yet. So, and, yeah. 
Yes, go ahead, please. Um, I have a question about the arsenic um, uh, side of your uh, conclusion. So I didn't quite understand. So you find that they're more likely to be the arsenic But is this supposed to be red? Um, sorry, I think I have disappeared. <laughs> Hello. I can yep. I can hear you now, but uh, you said something about the ethnicity. My my group my but because my Zoom was really sending me some it just died a message. <laughs> Make sure I actually can still be heard. But uh, yeah, that was my question because I didn't quite see. Um, because you know how can this be ethnic favoritism if the whole point is just to have rent seeking? Because wouldn't you want to build roads elsewhere that not is not in your own ethnic homeland? So, so I'm just trying to see see maybe I didn't really understand that point. Um, well, I, I hope I understand the question. But uh, mm -hmm. so what we find is that that we find more of this the roads being built that connect or deposits to ports if those deposits are actually in the ethnic homeland that that is yours. That if you are the, currently the ruler. Yeah, but then what's so, your interpretation of that result? I mean, because to me, if you describe this whole thing is all about rent seeking, right? And then I don't see why this is going to be a like a, a good thing for the ethnic homeland, right? Well, it shouldn't be that the opposite. I mean, it should be it is, it is right elsewhere, right? Yeah, I think it is ethnic favoritism, but I think your your question is close to where exactly would you uh, capture the rents? Is it is it in the capital city, you know, within mm -hmm. the government like that, or is some of that rent also captured in the ethnic homeland? And I think it's partly also the latter because, um, you know, those roads that are being built and the the deposit that's being developed, those are those are jobs and generates also local income, not just through through jobs. But um, um, you could also think of the the rulers, if especially if they're autocratic, that they have to appease also their uh, their power base, which may well be the ethnic group that they come from. So there are possible ways in which the rents are also sort of shared with that that ethnic homeland. But of course, it's our paper is not about shedding light exactly on how that works, but um, yeah, it is yeah, sort of consistent with that interpretation. I think it makes a lot of sense. I do think it matters a lot about like what you said about a power structure, because if it's autocratic, but it's like a popular sovereign. Uh, I think I'm cutting off again. Uh, then it wouldn't make. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, perhaps there's a non-linearity there in the degree to which the country is autocratic. That if it's a really an absolute ruler, then maybe you know there are less rents are shared with that ethnic homeland. If it's more in between, you know, then maybe more of that happens. And that 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 is also that's that is something we can look at. So, yeah. Sorry for the Zoom the disaster. I have, but I think I've I've come back. Yes, yeah. thank that, you. Thank you for that's okay. Have you thought about least cost pass? Um, yeah, so our way to do that, so we don't observe road construction costs in a very systematic way. We, we, we did use this World Bank Rocks database, which is you know shows us some gives us a sense of the cost of road construction of um, you know hundred something individual projects. Which it gives to give us an idea that you know repaving a road is about as costly as paving a new road. Um, but other than that, least cost we we take into account by by distance. Take the distance along along roads that existed by 2014. So we try to take into account all you know all places where you might possibly build a road already earlier in time. Right? So um, so least cost is I guess the uh, the shortest distance along roads that existed in 2014. And those are you know, those places you could have built a road in 1970 already, but you know maybe they haven't, maybe they have not. So that's our our least cost uh, approach there, which is just distance. I think we have. Uh, uh, oh, okay. Any any other question, uh, Monica? How we would be on time? I think I didn't. I was not there from the very beginning. Uh, I think we are five minutes behind the schedule, but it's oh, okay. fine. Uh, so we should probably move to the next speaker. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you. So I'll be in touch. Thank you. Okay. Let me see if you can see my screen and you can hear me. Yes, we can. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so let me put you here so I can see you. Uh, there you go. So first of all, thank you very much, Monica and Leonard, for the, for the opportunity to, to present here. Uh, and to everyone who already presented and is joining us uh, today, I'm, I'm really excited to share with you 
the results of what was my job market paper last year uh, on bureaucratic and nepotism. So let me start right away with the broad motivation of this paper uh, that is trying to understand how nepotism works uh, within uh, public sector uh, um, organizations. Um, and here, when I'm referring to nepotism, I'm referring to the specific form of favoritism in which jobs and promotions are provided to relatives within an organization. Uh, and we know that this practice is one of the most chronic and hard to identify pathologies within public administrations around the world. And one that is, uh, let's say, especially rooted in developing countries where family ties are, are, are strong. Um, we note also that this phenomenon has been persistent uh, despite multiple civil service reforms and anti-nepotism uh, legislation. And we as economists should care about this issue because it directly affects both the allocation and compensation of public sector workers that based on the results uh, in the literature, we know uh, are both uh, critical determinants of state capacity. Now, even though we have plenty of anecdotal accounts that this occur across different countries, across different uh, levels of the hierarchy, uh, branches of the government, systematic empirical evidence on the extent and function of this phenomenon is actually quite scarce. Uh, what we know so far is coming either from dynastic politics, like family connections to politicians, for example, but we don't know much about other bureaucrats, let's say what we would call bureaucrats instead of politicians. So. These non-elected to bureaucrats, for example, uh, for example, public sector managers and supervisors, we don't know much about this type of favoritism. So what we're gonna do um, in this paper is saying, well, this is quite surprising because in most developing countries, public sector managers and other career bureaucrats still retain a lot of discretion when it comes to public employment outcomes. So I'm gonna ask how this form of bureaucratic nepotism, as I call it, would operate in the public sector, how widespread it is, what are the potential benefits and costs uh, coming out of this practice, and also ask, in a sense, why the phenomenon has been persistent despite of all these reforms trying to stop it. Regardless of the context that you answer these questions, uh, you always have this kind of similar problems empirically. Uh, you need uh, information on the bureaucrats, uh, their career paths, their wages, how they got promoted, the timing of those uh, events, but also information on their family networks, how they are connected within the bureaucracy, uh, whether or not two individuals are related and so forth. Uh, and even if you take the problem of the data side, uh, there is another issue is just trying to find variation uh, in connectedness, in family connectedness that is you know, exogenous to, this, to these things. And also in policy uh, to say something meaningful in terms of the, uh, uh, let's say, econometrics uh, behind these, uh, these questions. So what I'm gonna do in this paper uh, is trying to overcome these challenges and contributing to answer these questions by focusing on the Colombian public sector uh, from 2011 to 2017 and conducting what I believe is the first systematic empirical examination of bureaucratic nepotism and anti-nepotism legislation uh, using data for this entire modern uh, bureaucracy. Uh, in a nutshell, what the paper does is studying the role that family connections to these public sector managers and supervisors uh, end up having in both the allocation and the compensation of civil servants. And in order to do that, I'm gonna be leveraging detailed biographical information employer employee records and the mandatory but confidential disclosure of family ties that are uh, that is in place in, in, in Colombia. Based on that information, basically recreate the entire career path of more than 1.1 million civil servants and uh, recreate the extended family networks of more than 2.4 million individuals via blood and marriage uh, ties. With that information, the basically, the process of the paper basically goes in three steps. In the first part of the paper, I'm going to show you that family connections in the public sector in Colombia are actually pervasive and how the presence of really close family connections are actually negatively related with the overall performance of these uh, 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 institutions. Then, so I'm going to be zooming into the let's say the returns to family connections, and in particular, what are the returns that uh, these bureaucrats have when a manager. Um, when a family member becomes a manager. So in order to do that, I'm gonna be exploiting within bureaucrat variation in family connection generated by these managerial turnovers. And what I'm gonna find is basically a positive and sizable returns to, to these connections. Increases in promotions probabilities and in earning capacity of these bureaucrats. Um, and I find that this, instead of a better screen of work, it's let's say that you're like paying for, for better, more efficiency or, or things like that, these are actually uh, consistent with nepotistic returns. I show part of the negative selection of these individuals and showing that these returns are actually temporary. Once you 
uh, lose the, the connection with your family member at, at the top of the hierarchy, those returns uh, disappear for you. And finally, once I, I hopefully, hopefully explain that this is uh, potentially negative for, 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 for the performance and for the selection of, of a better bureaucracy, I'm going to evaluate the enforcement of an anti-nepotism legislation that occurred in the country in 2015. And I'm going to do that by exploiting a sharp discontinuity in the set of family connections that were restricted by, by this law introduced in 2015 and show you the limited effectiveness of this type of reform that is common in many, in many other countries. This thing just reduced a bit. And when I look at the performance of these uh, organizations, uh, basically, uh, I find null, null effects. What I'm going to argue in the paper is that that, uh, let's say, underwhelming result is coming partially explained by the strategic response of, of bureaucrats to the policy change. In, in particular, uh, there was like a substitution effect, uh, the different margins of favoritism, and because a lot of these bureaucrats, instead of leaving, they just reshuffled posts within the public uh, administration. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to tell you that this uh, paper relates to a growing literature now on the personal and organizational economics of the state, and this idea of kinship, favoritism, and social incentives within organizations, uh, Jan Marco presented a really good paper that is actually one of the leading papers in this in this area uh, these days. Um, uh, but uh, there has been a, a lot of efforts in trying to understand the, the value of powerful connections in the public administration. Most of it is, has been uh, related to connections to politicians and not to other uh, middle range or, or uh, top bureaucrats, not elected top bureaucrats. Um, and there is also a nice discussion on how should we select a bureaucrats either by rules like exams or by purely discretion, what would be better for, for the public good provision, et cetera. Given that this uh, behavior is all illegal in most uh, countries, uh, this also relates to this literature on the misallocation of jobs and corruption. And the thing that I'm going to try to highlight here is that the main the contribution, contributions of this paper is that I'm, I'm able to identify and quantify this illegal and hard to uh, like a measure form of favoritism in the entire uh, modern pub in an entire modern public sector, and also showing how these connections to family members that you would imagine are not that important uh, shape public employment outcomes and the quality of the public sector workforce. Um, also, I think this is the first paper evaluating an anti-nepotism legislation in modern uh, uh, states, and also. I, I believe that the method that I'm going to provide you to how to reconstruct these family networks is quite uh, novel and, and useful for, for other settings in case you want to uh, apply it. So I'm going to be talking about the Colombian public sector. So let me give you a quick institutional uh, background. Um, here, um, the Colombian public sector is uh, um, a bureaucracy of about 1.2 million public servants. This public sector represents about 11% of the total formal employment in the country. And even though they introduced a meritocratic civil service system in 1991, by 2015, less than 50% of the total public sector employment, let's say, was allocated via meritocratic exams. And the reason why this happens is because even though you need to pass an exam to enter into the public administration, anything that happens after that, your promotions, how you get to a managerial position, doesn't depend on, on, on exams. And second, all these exams apply for career bureaucrats and not to contractors. And unfortunately, like it happens in many uh, developing countries, there is a huge part of uh, temporary contractors. So in Colombia, these uh, temporary contractors account for 38% of the total workforce uh, in the country. So this is an ideal setting to study uh, bureaucratic nepotism because most of these recruitment and promotions are going to be driven by these discretionary appointments and temporary contracts. So here, both politicians and also these non-elected top bureaucrats are going to influence and what is going to happen to the career paths of, of, of this. Okay, uh, in terms of data, uh, I would say that uh, the data is, in, in summary, basically administrative data on the universe of bureaucrats in Colombia, and it comes in two flavors. One is information on public <coughs> sector employment, yearly employee employee records on uh, how, like each institution, every bureaucrat, and also information on family ties that comes from this declaration of conflict of interest uh, that uh, pushes these individuals before they entering to report um, or like mandate that they need to report their family members in the first degree of consanguinity and affinity. To pick some ideas, what, what, what I have here is uh, like a sample of how the data looks like. At the moment of entry, all the bureaucrats report two things. First, uh, common formatted CV with all the information that a CV should have, job spell data, including position, institutions, and all the 
start and end dates of your previous uh, uh, labor market experience and information on you know academic background etc but also you need to report at the moment of entry who your family members are in the first degree of consanguinity and affinity that means you need to report who your parents your children and your spouse are and you need to do it with national identification numbers full names gender and regardless they are or not uh, within uh, the public sector so those are the, the two main components and based on that i'm going to basically create a half yearly panel of this 1.1 uh, ever bureaucrats from 2011 to 2017 and then this set of clusters of families of more than 700,000 families uh, connecting uh, more than 2.4 million individuals as I mentioned before. Uh, Gianmarco mentioned this and uh, many of you uh, have suggested the, the issue that we have when we are trying to, to, to look at bureaucracies having measures of performance that are, are comparable across agencies and uh, across different individuals is it's quite challenging and, and here I'm trying to overcome this issue in two ways. Uh, I was lucky, uh, I've been very lucky that in Colombia, the measure of these things is, is quite nice. Uh, I'm using a multi-dimensional index of performance at the agency level in which each of these institutions, depending on their objective uh, in the constitution, they set a set of goals by the end of part of, for, the, for the rest of the year, at the beginning of the year for the rest of the year. And at the end of the year, they, they, they look at an assessment and say, okay, from zero to 100, how well we perform in this, and they need to provide proofs of this, uh, you know, this performance. Since this is self-reported performance, I also leverage information from Transparency International that have an independent assessment of the same set of goals uh, and rank the institutions again with index from zero to 100. Uh, and this is just for, for the agency level measures. Now, in terms of individual performance, you would imagine that it's even harder uh, how you compare uh, the productivity of a nurse uh, with the productivity of, of a teacher, of a lawyer, this type of things. Um, so I'm, I'm going to have specific measures of performance, but I have a measure of missed performance, information on disciplinary, criminal, and fiscal records uh, uh, of these individuals that comes from the uh, Office of the Inspector General in, in Colombia. So let me go very quickly on how I reconstruct the family network, because I think it's one of the main uh, elements of the of the paper so usually other papers have to rely on things like share last names or you share a couple of names, you come from the same ethnicity or go or you were born in the same uh, uh, municipality here i don't need anything of that. So what i'm anything of that what i'm gonna do is um using the report of family connections and create a network representation of that reporting here notes are going to represent individuals Edges are going to represent connections via blood or marriage ties, and the weight of these connections are going to be always one, meaning this is one degree of consanguinity or affinity between individuals. Okay, and based on this, I'm going to have like basically millions of clusters of these uh, triads or or, or 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 more connections or, or stars in, uh, of networks, and what I'm going to do is connect them based on the report that they need to do the year that they enter and the update that they need to do every year after that. So. In a nutshell, what is going to happen is something like this. Bureaucrat A enters into the public administration and uh, reports uh, family members A1, A2, and A3. And then in a subsequent period, I observe another bureaucrat B reporting A1 and A2. Given that I have information, their identification numbers and full names and gender, et cetera, I know that these two individuals are actually the same. So I can simplify the network topology now. And I know that Bureaucrat B and Bureaucrat A are actually connected to one and two degrees of consanguinity. But something that we didn't know before is that B and A3 are actually connected to one, two, and three degrees of consanguinity. And here the thing gets better because now I can replicate this uh, problem for every year across all the institutions, uh, across uh, all over uh, uh, municipalities in Colombia, but also over time. So let's say that someone at some point in time decided not to report you because uh, Maybe they, they, they hired their, their wife or, or, or their husband, um, and they decided not to do so. It turns out if in the past, they report each other in any potential uh, uh, sense, I would be able to recover that connection. So first step, connecting within the year. Second step, have this backward and forward tie recovery. And once I have that, I put everything in on just one dimension. All the connections are going to be fixed. And the only thing that's going to change over time is the status of these nodes whether or not you are a public servant at time t. Okay. 
Uh, in terms of the reconstruction, I'm doing anything like super crazy here in the sense that I'm not adding a lot of connections doing this. On average, I'm recovering just one connection per family. But these guys that I'm recovering here enough, are enough to radically change the distribution of family sizes. I'm showing you in the panel on the right how the distribution of family sizes moves to the, towards the right. And to give you a sense on, on the dimension of this issue is if I have the official largest family network that I look at the raw, 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 raw data is something similar to, uh, to something that I have shown you here on the left. But if I use my algorithm of these two simple steps, you can see that the largest family network that I observe is something similar to what I observe here on the right. The nice thing is that like this cluster have hundreds of thousands of, of these ones that I can investigate further in the next part of the, of the empirical strategy. Juan Felipe, a quick clarifying question. Sure. In that in that very nice figure on the right that you just showed us, if I compare like one extreme to the other, would this be like 10th degree cousins, something like that? Or, or yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is an extreme case. Um, so yeah, there would be like 10th, 12th uh, cousin uh, type of relationship. So think, think about this, like uh, in order to observe this, this should be like a family that has a lot of descendants. Uh, but also a lot of people within each generation. Uh, and that's how I'm able to, to recreate this, this type of thing. And feel free to postpone this, but just so that I say it, could it be that in some cases, this network is a bit serendipitous? Like it turns out that I have a 15th cousin that is also working for the government. And, you know, it's just kind of luck rather than some strategic. Totally, totally. Sorry. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna be using that uh, uh, at all. Uh, um, uh, actually, Luis, what, what, what I'm having in mind here is, 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 is something different. I'm not going to be using the fact that you are connected because the mere presence of family connection is not a proof of nepotism. Um, but, but yes, if you can take that uh, you know, example to the extreme, uh, at some point we are all related, if you want. Uh, we come from the same sense type, type, type of thing. Um, but here what I'm going to use is see, uh, given that this is coming from the entrance of uh, and the timing of the entrance of these individuals, I can see whether or not really close uh, family members are getting in uh, or, uh, or not. Let, let me see if once I explain uh, what is the empirical strategy uh, that, that uh, clarifies a bit more uh, what, yeah, what, I'm, what I'm using. Um, well, Felipe, one, one quick follow-up here. I mean, yeah. Did I understand correctly that the only way two nodes can, uh, can link to each other is by marriage, right? So, so you're never able to identify like a four degree cousin. No, no, or, I can, can I can. Uh, yeah, I can, I can. And this is this is this is the nice the nice thing of of, of the uh -huh. specification. Given that these guys need to report their family members not only at the moment of entry, but they need to update everything uh, like this information every year after that. Let's say that you observe you report your parents, your children, and your spouse, right? Uh -huh. And in the next year, in the next uh, couple of periods, your children enters and need to report parents. So then it's going to report you, but also report their own children, their spouse, etc. So there is going to happen uh, in, in the data is that I observe chains of connections uh, through this uh, type of, of, of uh, second and third degrees, um, if that makes, uh, makes sense. Imagine that I report my parents, my brothers report the same parents, but they, uh, my brother report uh, his uh, uh, wife. Got it. So Got now it. I have that, you know, I, I have this, type. And my, then my wife enter, uh, his wife enters, sorry, and reports family members. So then I can keep extending the, the family uh, tree. Um, okay, perfect. So uh, let me just do uh, here this thing. Um, so very quickly, uh, usually I spend a lot of time giving you some stylized facts just based on the reconstruction, but let me tell you uh, the three facts very briefly. So the first fact on, on the data is that family connections are actually pervasive within the public administration. If I look at connections across different agencies, and, and over time, uh, those are presents everywhere. Uh, but just to give you a summary statistic here on panel A, I'm showing you the share of bureaucrats that have a family member who is also a bureaucrat. And you can see that this is a steady about 36% of bureaucrats are, are in that situation. But also if you think, oh, how they are connected to managers that matter, like bureaucrats that matter, let's say, that have like power and influence, about 18% of all bureaucrats have a family connection to a top manager or, or someone who's making a decision in hiring and promotions. Even worse, if you look at what happens with family connections within the same unit and institution that you're working on, that number is about 11%. Uh, 
And this is what it means is that uh, you're having a family connection and any degree uh, of separation within the same institution, within the same unit that you're working at. Uh, and if you look at that trend on, on how these, these connections are, are happening, even to, to managers, I observe that this, this type of connections are increasing uh, over time. The second fact is that about by fourth, like 26% of the recovered linkages are coming from bureaucrat bureaucrat ties. This means that at some point when I'm looking at, at the network and, and, and trying to see what are the missing linkages, most of them comes from uh, nodes that at some point become bureaucrats. And this 26% is telling me something about the strategic incentive of not reporting family members when they are a bureaucrat, okay? And finally, if I compute the average path length in this network, let's say the average uh, degree of consanguinity between uh, red nodes in, in, in those graphs is about three degrees. And three degrees of consanguinity, to, to give you a sense of, of what I'm talking here, this is a table of consanguinity. So person, if you are this person, your parents have a degree of consanguinity one and your children a degree of consanguinity one, but your brothers are at degree one and two, your nephews at degree three, your first cousins are one, two, three, and four degrees of consanguinity. But if you add, for instance, an all this, a wife or a husband, you're going to add one more degree of, of connection. Uh, let's see. Okay, there you go. So all these facts basically highlight the potential presence of nepotism. And why I'm saying potential presence? Because the mere existence of family connections does not imply nepotism at all. You need the timing of the fact. In the moment that you have power, then my family members become uh, uh, or receiving some benefits, right? But in any case, this highlights the presence of nepotism because in Colombia, uh, since the introduction of the constitution in 1991, the appointment of family members uh, is prohibited if those, are con if those individuals are connected uh, below four degrees of consanguinity. Now, moving to the empirical results, let me tell you what happens in a simple correlational analysis, how the presence of family connections relates to the performance of a public sector agencies. So here in two panels, I'm showing you data from the government, their self-reported performance, if you want, of each institution. And in panel B, uh, the independent assessment of Transparency International for those uh, uh, institutions. And as you can see here, each one of these dots is uh, one agency, and I'm plotting the number of family connections uh, below four degrees of consanguinity per 10,000 employees, and on the y-axis, uh, uh, the performance between zero and 100. And as you can see, there is a clear negatively correlation between these two. And if I go deeper into in that correlation and try to see, well, maybe this is driven by, let's say, the, the degree of centralization of these institutions, the administrative level that we are talking about here, the branch of the government, or maybe it's the type of agency there, like dependent of, let's say, the Ministry of Finance uh, or Education, and this is a small school that depends on another one, that type of thing, you will see that the correlation uh, remains uh, negative and significant. Okay. And this is not saying that this is causal at all, but tells us that there is some at least selection in the sense that worse institutions tend to have more family members uh, uh, on a per, uh, per uh, employee basis. So f five more minutes so that we have some time for questions. Oh, my God, just five. Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, let me or, just... Or, or six or seven. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, I, I will, I'll try to rush it up uh, a bit, but okay. uh, so... What I'm gonna do now is, okay, I show you that there's, there's negative correlation, that connections are uh, everywhere. Um, but now what we need to do is estimating the returns of nepotism, like measuring actually the presence of nepotism. How am I gonna do that? So the first thing that I'm gonna do to show you this is uh, talking about uh, public sector managers and supervisors, not elected individuals in this sense. So if you think about the typical hierarchical structure of the state in Colombia, it looks like something on the right here. So we have the agency managers, managers, uh, advisors, and the rest of the, uh, of the division, professional, technicians, clerical and blue collar jobs, and a lot of contractors, uh, contractors in all the levels. So what I'm gonna do here is see what happens with, this, uh, with the career paths of these individuals in red, uh, green, and black here, um, when uh, managers turn over, and for, this, uh, for the occurrence of this turnover, I happen to be connected with, with the manager uh, on the top. To give you a sense of the composition of these uh, hierarchies, uh, I'm talking about the turnover about 13% of the, of the workforce and see what happens to the rest of the bureaucracy, the 85% so uh, below. 
Okay, so this idea uh, uh, is, is what is going to motivate empirical strategy, uh, and the idea here is to say, okay, if I just compare connected versus non-connected individuals, I'm going to fail to account for a lot of confounders uh, that are important. People self-select to the same institutions for a variety of reasons. People can find love, <laughs> the, the, the love of their lives in, in, the, in the workplace, and therefore uh, observing these two family members in the same organization doesn't mean anything. So. What I'm going to do is to explore within bureaucrat variation in family connections. So I'm going to explore the fact the timing in which these turnovers uh, occur and how that affect me, my connections to, to the guys on top. And in order to do that, the employment outcomes that I'm going to look uh, uh, here <clears throat> are basically the log of earnings uh, of these individuals at time t and uh, uh, a dummy of being hierarchically promoted from one of these levels that I showed you before. To explore the variation that I'm uh, uh, that helped me to isolate this thing. I'm just gonna be using uh, uh, here individual, uh, uh, like basically bureaucrat fixed effects, time fixed effects. And uh, uh, I'm running these uh, outcomes on a dummy that tells me whether individual I from family F has a family connection to a top manager at time T and a set of controls uh, uh, that we know uh, affect this directly. For example, uh, your experience, your education and controlling flexibly for multiple interactions of that in the regression. Of course, this idea does not occur only in, in the state as a whole. So we can go even further and add agency fixed effects. So see what happens within a particular agency in the state and see whether or not this uh, nepotistic uh, or, or these returns are happening in there or not. And then ETA, of course, are gonna capture uh, the presence of those uh, returns. Let me skip this, uh, the part of the identification strategy and go uh, right away on the main result in terms of hierarchical promotions. What you see around the event of being connected to a top uh, uh, to a manager uh, via family connections, you observe a sharp increase in the probability of being hierarchically promoted. And this is in terms of uh, comparing to the mean, it's about a 40% increase in the probability of being hierarchically promoted. If you look at these effects by the level of consanguinity, how close you are uh, to, to, to the manager, something uh, very interesting happens, at least for me, is that all these connections, uh, all these returns are not occurring for your wife, like the degree of consanguinity one, your children, your, your spouse. What is uh, uh, happening here is that it's happening through distance connections that are harder to identify for, 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 for authorities. So degrees of consanguinity three, four, and five. And then as you would expect, if you are really, really far away, and this is to, to mention what, uh, what Liz was, uh, was uh, trying to hint that, if you are really, really far away, uh, basically the connection, you, 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 have, you have a family member, but it's if you're seventh cousin, it doesn't matter. So I don't find any effects for degrees of consanguinity uh, uh, above six, uh, uh, basically. But all the effects are concentrated, again, on basically cousins, uncles, uh, uh, grandparents, and, and this type of, of, of connections, and uh, nephews and nieces. The second thing uh, that I want to highlight here very quickly is that these are temporary uh, returns. If you compare the effects of winning versus losing a connection, you would see that are almost symmetric uh, in, the, in that sense. So you receive an increase in the probability of being hierarchically promoted, but that increase in that probability disappears if you lose the connection to the top. And this is the same both for hierarchical promotions, just the dummy of being promoted to a different uh, position, but also in terms of wages. Uh, and this is important to differentiate because you can have hierarchical promotions without any changes in wages and also have uh, increases in wages that are not related with hierarchical promotions like paying extra hours or being the leader of a coordinating team that implies more payment for you, but your title is basically uh, the same. And I find basically the same type of, of results and increasing in earnings and increasing the probability of being. Um, in the interest of time, let me tell you what I do in terms of selection. Uh, I know that the process in which these individuals, uh, managers are making the decision is, is quite hard to, to identify and observe the exact process of recruitment or, or hiring uh, or even the promotion uh, uh, process. But what you can do is trying to approximate this, uh, uh, this, this process of, 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 of decision, you know, how, how they make this decision. So um, this wouldn't be really a problem. Let's say that we are benefiting family members, but it turns out that these guys are super efficient. They're uh, putting all the effort that required and doing the, the right thing. That would be a problem even if this is uh, illegal. Um, but the issue that I can do here is looking at pre-promotion characteristics. Create uh, uh, groups of individuals that at the moment of the promotion of a of, um, uh, um, co-worker 
have like similar characteristics. They are in the same hierarchical level, in the same period, have similar uh, uh, years of experience, etc. And we see at the moment of promotion how compared those who were promoted with the past over ones. Okay. And here I'm showing you for different characteristics what happens to those who are promoted. In general, uh, promoted individuals are less likely to have a disciplinary record, less likely to have an impediment record, and more likely to have um, uh, higher education above the requirement that they need for that position and have more public sector uh, experience. Okay. But if you look at what happens when you are uh, promoted, but at the moment of the promotion, you are family connected, that is basically this interaction, what you see is that this effect reverses. So top managers overlooked uh, those characteristics, um, or at least in, in the net effects, is reduced, the, the, this positive selection is reduced when you are uh, connected to the, to the manager. Now, uh, I, I would be happy to discuss uh, all the robustness and what I do to, to, uh, to, to show that this is actually negative selection, but let me tell you what I do as the last part of the paper. I'm gonna exploit a, a policy experiment that occurred at the end, uh, uh, like in the middle of my period in 2015. It turns out that a scandal in the judiciary uh, in 2013 uncovered a set of loopholes with the uh, current uh, anti-nepotism legislation. If you see the wording of the, of the law initially says that civil servants may not appoint as employees individuals to whom they are keen up to four degrees of consanguinity and that they cannot intervene in their designation. However, in this wording, what happens is that nominations and proposals uh, an indirect hiring was possible. For example, I can just hire a friend and then my friend can hire my family member. He's gonna be the one signing the contracts type of thing. But then what is happening is that uh, as an outcome, I'm working with my family members, right? There was also the possibility that you can nominate them in a hiring committee. So you, don't, you are not hiring, you are not part of the committee, but you pass the CV and say, look, you should uh, hire this, this uh, worker. And then uh, uh, as a consequence of that, you have also an apatistic practice. And finally, civil servants uh, were like considered a category that, dif that was different from contractors. So contractors were not included in this law. So after 2015, and this is scandal in the judiciary, they changed that and they say, okay, you cannot nominate, you cannot propose, you cannot contract. Uh, basically, you cannot do anything of this indirect hiring. And then what I'm going to do is evaluate that, uh, that law. What I'm going to do is create an, a, a panel in which I have for every institution in the public sector, 16 beans. In each beans, I, ba I basically correspond to a degree of separation between uh, family members. So I'm going to count the number of family connections in institution K that are a degree of consanguinity, one, two, three, four, and so on and so forth, as the, uh, until uh, 16 beans. Okay? And then running a simple difference in difference uh, regression in which I look at the number of family connections per 2,000 employees at each one of these degrees of separation on a dummy of being post the law and a dummy of being below four, okay? Uh, and I think it's easier with the Venn study where I observe is a decrease in the number of illegal connections, which is kind of, of what we'd expect, but this decrease is only 15% uh, compared to the, to, to the mean, uh, which is not, not that great given that this was like a, a, national, a national law. And more importantly, if I look at the effect by degrees of consanguinity was only concentrated in degree of consanguinity one and two that we know now uh, for the previous results uh, that were not the ones who were uh, getting most of the returns uh, of these connections. Um, what happens to performance? So if I look at 2015 and the initial correlations that I showed you about how connections and performance are related, here now I have like an exogenous shock and what I, I can see is that, okay, after 2015, basically the effect on performance is basically no. And more importantly, even if you will believe that I don't have, let's say, enough power, the sign is going to the opposite direction. Even after 2015, the performance got uh, even, uh, even worse. So what happened? My explanation in the paper is that this was the results of a strategic response of bureaucrats. In particular, guys at the top substituting, uh, substitute, substituted different margins of favoritism. In particular, in the law, as you can uh, remember uh, in that slide, it says that you cannot appoint family members, but they don't say anything about uh, providing them extra hours or giving them more you know, temporary positions, this type of thing. And therefore, what you observe is that after 2015, there is a decrease in these hierarchical promotions and the return of these hierarchical promotions, but then an increase in the terms of wages. So they just substitute what was the margin of favoritism. And finally, the guys at the bottom, uh, instead of leaving the public sector when they're doing this something, part of these illegal connections, they remain 
uh, in the same institutions. About 40% remain in the same uh, position, and the rest just reshuffle within a post in the public administration. I'm, I don't have time to go over all the specifications uh, and explanation of these graphs, but let me tell you just the, the big picture. I'd observe whether or not these individuals remain illegal, go to a different institution in the public sector and are legal or go out. out. And you can see this a lot of like movement between these uh, uh, things, but at the end, there is a bunch of people who remain illegal. Recidivism is also a problem. Every period, there are 10% of these uh, nepotistic bureaucrats who manage to get in into a different uh, uh, organization, which is also bad. And therefore, these effects on performance uh, kind of uh, make sense. So let me conclude here. Uh, uh, what I do in this paper is basically examine the a chronic but empirically understudied form of favoritism in the public sector. This nepotism exercised by non-elected uh, top bureaucrats. I focus on Colombia and the entire public administration and you find the widespread uh, uh, you know, presence of these connections, uh, how they relate negatively with performance, how this affect uh, uh, the allocation and compensation of workers and how they negatively select in terms of public sector experience, education and record of misconduct. And when I look at the law that try to stop this from happening, I show the limitations, uh, uh, how like this type of law that are present in many other countries are not uh, getting at the at the uh, at the right thing because partially what is happening is that bureaucrats strategically respond to this thing. So let me leave you with the last message. I think these findings provide the first systematic empirical examination of bureaucratic nepotism and anti-nepotism legislation. And let me close there with just the policy implications so we can discuss a bit on the on the on this question side. Th thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you. So we have uh, maybe five minutes. Um, comments, questions? I have a, a minor question uh, related to, to identification. Well, uh, actually a couple. Um, so in, in, your, in your main specification for, for the probability of promotion, um, you're exploiting within individual variation, right? On, on who's... Yeah. Uh, basically, so, so, so there, your identifying variation is restricted to, to sort of the successful clans, no? Uh, so th those clans or families who, who manage to get someone to... Uh, so it, it, it's, it's quite a bit of a selected sample, no? The... Yeah, so this, that, that's what you would expect, actually, uh, because the nepotism is happening from the successful ones. You, you don't have nepotism from those who are never managers because they, cannot have, they don't have the power, actually, to exercise nepotism. Which, which makes kind of, kind of sense. Um, yeah. Okay, and, 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 the, and the second point, basically when, when I don't know how, how does it work in the, in the Colombian public administration, but when you have promotion, that mechanically is a demotion? Uh, so, so basically I, 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 I promote my, my, my sister uh, and I demote, someone else's sister. Oh, that's that's a good point. Um, not, not really. So you, you can have, uh, if you want, the creation of positions in the sense, because in Colombia, what we have is there are just basically five levels, the ones that I showed you. Uh -huh. So you can promote from technician to a professional if you have the requirements of, of, of education, let's say. Um, but you can have as many professionals as you want. Um, so it's, it's, just, it's just like the, the rank. Um, okay. It's an assistant to associate professor. Any other comments? Juan Felipe, you said you had all the levels of government. Have you, have you looked at heterogeneous effects? Because presumably a small municipality, it is easier to do this than like in a, in, a, in a bigger, more professionalized agency of the national government? Yes, yes. And, and uh, it's, unfortunately, this has been recorded, so I cannot give a specific examples <laughs> of municipalities. Uh, and, and it's part of actually the... the, the the restrictions of the data. I cannot give you examples, but something that I find is yes, there's a lot of this heterogeneity. And actually, as you would expect, municipalities uh, that are quite small, um, they have like more family members to begin with. Uh, and second, uh, they perform uh, worse uh, for also all, all other reasons. So um, I, I observe a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot document that in the in the paper um, for you know restrictions. Uh, on 
but is, is that somewhere related to, for example, political competition? Uh, there's a lot of political competition. There's more accountability. Mm, yeah. Just it, a curiosity. It would be a minor result. But, um. Yeah. No, 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 no. It, it, it actually could be the case. In, and it's, it's, not, it's not a minor question, Gianmarco. I think it's, it's highly correlated with, with, with the thing is that most of the, these turnovers that I'm observing are political decisions of some, of some sort. Um, so places that have more turnovers could be correlated, you know, political uh, connections, etc. So something that I, that I want to show that I couldn't, and I think is important for for the empirical strategy, it's 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 really this exercise on rolling out common shocks. So imagine the following: you have a network, and you observe a manager and a family member of that manager getting uh, the position, like this guy a promotion and this guy getting uh, as a manager in that situation. This could happen for many reasons, and it's not necessarily nepotism. It could be because they have a third guy, the politician, that appoints them both. And therefore, this is just political patronage, classic papers, instead of nepotism. So the way that I'm solving that issue is that the way that uh, this is constructed, this is a common shock to the, uh, to the family network. So anything that goes at the family time level, I need to uh, account for this type of common shocks. Um, and, and I'm able to do that. I, I add just family time fix effects and these common shocks. And what I find is that if anything, these uh, returns go up. Now, you, once you clean the correlation from, the, from these potential uh, common shocks, uh, I have a cleaner, a cleaner effect. Uh, but, but it's actually a, a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, this is a bit uh, beyond the scope of the paper, but nepotism is to help a family member, but it's also a way to protect against corrupt practices, because basically, you know, I mean, if you are doing something illegal, then you have a family member in a good position to cover your back, you know. So um, is that something that you you have thought about as maybe a follow up to this? Yes, yes. Uh, so Leonard, I actually. I'm sorry that it went super fast on, on this uh, table, but actually that is what I have in terms of, of misperformance. So I have information on corruption. So <sighs> what, you would what would you expect was like, okay, top connected people are potentially more corrupt, let's say. Uh, it's just an hypothesis. What I find is actually the opposite. So people who are family connected to guys on the top, on average, they're actually better. They have uh, less uh, probability of have a disciplinary record less probability of have a, an impediment record to be part of the bureaucracy in subsequent periods, and they are more educated and have more, more public sector experience. So on average, these guys are not, these managers are not like bad people, and the connected people are also not bad people. The distortion comes with the interaction of the timing of the effect. If you are promoted by your family member who is a manager, then all this, let's say, the judgment of the, of the managers uh, kind of, kind of uh, are into questions. They 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 overlook this these uh, positive uh, characteristics. Let's say. Yeah. But you might want to expand this to include legal corruption, meaning yeah, co conflict of interest. Oh, you know? okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, like for instance, um, you know, I, and I think uh, the capture and these things. State capture. Yeah, yeah. No, you sense. want to make sure that you know people at the right places you know, make, make you do this, you know, with li little or no um, cost, you know. Okay. Yeah, no. Yeah, anyway. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great, great. Anyway, well, yeah. Well, one final question, just following up on, on, on Luis's point before, is there a way to, um, to estimate the, the, the productivity cost of this, of nepotism, at different ranks of, of the, uh, no, because I mean, in in, in bureaucracies with with low monitoring power, uh, the, the typical defense here's their, their cussing is okay, but I need I need someone I trust here, right? So yeah. so and and that argument would apply to to upper management positions, where whereas if you're uh, promoting someone uh, from from clerk to, I don't know, like an uh, accountant, uh, there's clearly a, a loss in, um, in, in productivity, no? Uh, I wonder if, 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 if yeah, yeah. There, is, there is an empirical support to the claim that, that meeting someone you trust um, is indeed helping 
the productivity of the public sector. So actually something that I'm doing, uh, and this is potentially part of the reviewing uh, our scenario that I need to do for, for submissions, is that I have the information, for instance, in, 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 in organizations in which distrust matters uh, the most. Mm. So think about uh, doctors. There is something you say, like, if you are a doctor, you're not going to hire your dumb cousin in the same hospital that you're working on. That's going to generate a lot of issues, right? So then the trust kind of kind of uh, make make sense and there are other situations in which you're if you're like a random accountant in the accountant department and you hire your dumb cousin it doesn't matter um so so that heterogeneity depending on the institution it's something that i'm thinking of unfortunately again i cannot say specific agencies but what i'm going to do is create an index saying how um trustworthy the uh, occupation or the job is and try to, to exploit but but it's a, it's a good point there i could just exploit that that type of you know try to answer to the oh no it's not trust actually even in the trust uh, uh, places uh, this is this is this is bad all right so i think thank you very much um so um do let me say a few words before we we all we all leave. Um, so I mean, first of all, I I'd like to thank uh, all of you for fantastic presentation. That had been a great, um, great set of papers and so on. And thank uh, Doug and Joe for the, you know putting this whole program together. Christy for um, managing uh, the whole the, the the conference and also the program as a whole. And then uh, Monica, you know, for all her work. Um, so I, I think what I, I really enjoy the most is the range, the substantive topics that have been covered, you know, uh, you know, bureaucracies, um, affirmative action, uh, decentralization, uh, you know, nepotism, uh, you know, uh, roads, um, you know, efficiency of road networks and political economy. So this is this is wonderful, and uh, also enjoy the methodological breadth of all this, you know, um, and um, you know it's um, it, it's fantastic, and I, I think um, it, it just shows how the intersection of between political economy and development and all these papers are this intersection is very, you know, it's very much uh, cutting edge in the profession, and you know it's something to really push and encourage and uh you know when next time i i talk to people from nbr and other places and I, i'm going to point to this conference and say you know i mean <laughs> we we have to be uh you know at uh, the fourth front front row you know so don't don't pass by us before you you move to the next uh, role you know so um anyway so that's that, that was great so now having said that i think um I'm going to maybe push some agenda here a little bit by saying that, um, you know, we, I think the, the whole exercise will benefit from more theory, you know, so I think sometimes, you know, you have the result, everything is in place, but you say, what is the mechanism, you know, but even when you have a sense empirical about many companies, you have to look at the deeper one. You know, for instance, well, you, it's impossible to do it without model. And I wish, for instance, that for these kind of conferences that we have more theory people involved, even no data, nothing, but they try to eliminate, you know, how we should do, look at these things. Obviously, there are papers that do both, and it's all it's all great. And, and the second point is that um, I also wish political economy is, especially uh, when it has to do with development, like what we are doing, is more prescriptive. You know, I think if I want to take this and go to the president of Brazil. Oh, no, I'm sorry. So I don't know who he is. <laughs> a place that I know, president of Cote d'Ivoire, you know? Uh, or, or I'm going to say, okay, yeah, okay, okay, that's all great. You know, nepotism, yes. Uh, what do I do? You know, do I need transparency, for instance? Do I need to find mechanism to expose this? Um, and this is, does, it, does this going to matter? For instance, decentralization, it has this distortion that, you know, okay, that what do we do? Are there a way we can institutionalize some practices in local government so that we can actually overcome these things? You know, I, I think for me, this is 
this is something that maybe require a little bit more kind of investment for us to push this research agenda a little bit further because I think um, one of oh, let me, let me one of the reasons why development economics in general, for instance, had a lot of success recently is because we always ask this practical question at the end, or at the beginning, I'd see, at least, and have some answers. So as a result, um, you know, I understand why public official might pay attention, but also also might generate funding to do the work because at the end of the day, we want to sort of point to a couple of things that can be done to fix um, you know, those issues. And I think, um, and uh, anyway, so yeah, I really much enjoy this. And I think this is going to be hopefully a beginning of uh, a community that is growing and we need to stay together and so that we can maybe, um, you know, basically, um, you know, have many more opportunities like this, you know, to share and to engage each other. All right, so thanks everyone <laughs> for, 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 for joining to stay until this late and, um, and keep in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you, Leonard. Yeah. Thank you, bye-bye. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend, everyone. Bye-bye.